Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I am Zach. I am your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. And tonight I bring you the last chapter of just part one of the last chapter of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, one of the foundational texts of anarcho-communist theory, written just about 130 years ago in the, in the late 1890s, or I guess mid-1890s, I believe, because this, this chapter is about agriculture. So I invited on um, a friend of mine who's, who's a permaculture teacher and designer. Uh, so... Uh, without further ado, I think we're going to get into the chapter. There'll be a lot of opportunity to fold in some of the ideas that we've been talking about, especially things like uh, permaculture when, when it comes to Kropotkin's idea of, of alleviating work from, um, I, I guess, just farmers um, of his time. And and he, he realized, as you'll see, he, he relies very heavily on the idea of technological advancements coming to to be the the savior of uh i guess labor but since since his time there's been a lot of developments a lot of, of theories developed especially as i say in the realm of permaculture so perhaps there's some alternative routes where we could have higher production uh with with perhaps more physical manual labor than the average farm uh requires now thanks to, to massive mechanization, especially when you talk about uh, large cereal crops. Um, but still not so much that it's, it's an overwhelming life that, that is just backbreaking work. But we'll get into that as we get into this chapter. So let's give it a start. Here we go with part one uh, of chapter 17 of A Conquest of Bread, Agriculture. Let me know how the volume is too, if, it, if it's uh, coming in clear. This audio production was you. made in collaboration with Let's Audible Anarchist. All the way up, so let's turn it down there. The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, Chapter 17, Agriculture, Part 1. Political economy has That's often been reproached with drawing all its deductions from the decidedly false... Now, to, to me, that, that's sounding a bit soft, so I'm going to bump it up just a little bit. Uh, let me know what you think. In terms of the audio principle that the only incentive capable of forcing a man to augment his power of production is personal interest in its narrowest sense their approach is perfectly true so true that epochs of great industrial discoveries and true progress in industry are precisely those in which the happiness of all was inspiring men and in which personal enrichment was the least thought of the great investigators in science and the great inventors aimed above all at giving greater freedom of mankind and if Watt, Stevenson, Jacquard, etc., could have only foreseen what a state of misery their sleepless nights would bring to the workers, they certainly Still would have burned soft. their designs okay. and broken their Let's models. Turn it up even a bit more. Another principle that pervades political economy is just as false. It is the tacit admission common to all economists that if there is often overproduction in certain branches, a society will nevertheless never have sufficient products to satisfy the wants of all, and that Consequently, the day will never come when nobody will be forced to sell his Better labor not. in exchange okay. for wages. Thank you very much. This tacit admission is found at the basis of all theories and all the so-called laws taught by economists. And yet, it is certain that the day when any civilized association of individuals would ask itself what are the needs of all and the means of satisfying them, it would see that in industry, as in agriculture, it already possesses sufficient to provide abundantly for all needs on condition that it knows how to apply these means to satisfy real needs. That this is true as regards industry no one can contest. Indeed, it suffices to study the processes already in use to extract coals and ore, to obtain steel and work it, to manufacture on a great scale what is used for clothing, etc., in order to perceive that we could already increase our production fourfold or more, and yet use for that less work than we are using now. We go further. We assert that agriculture is in the same position. Those who cultivate the soil, like the manufacturers, already could increase the production, not only fourfold, but tenfold. And they can put it into practice as soon as they feel the need of it, as soon as a socialist organization of work will be established instead of the present capitalistic one. So this is going to be tying in a bunch of his ideas from previous chapters on, on how the, the current uh, configuration of work, or at least current for his time, um, which still has relevance today uh, because people don't necessarily own the means of production that they are toiling for. 
uh, they're not going to necessarily work harder than they need to, right? You're not going to work as though you're making uh, $20 an hour when you're only getting 10, right? I mean, it just makes sense. Doesn't doesn't profit you at all. In fact, um, in, in a lot of jobs, the, the, the current idea from the employer is that basically they own your time. So, you know, everyone's heard the, the um, phrase, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean, right? So what, what does it get you if, you if you work a little bit harder and you get your, done, your job done sooner? Well, you just get to do more work. So uh, when there's, there's no real incentive to work harder other than perhaps promotion, but of course promotions aren't available for everyone. They have some people still, there always has to be the most people at the bottom of any organization. That, that's just how it works in order for capitalism to work, for there to be excess profit that you can skim off as an owner and, and decide where it goes. Um, so, I mean, n- no matter what, there's going to be people occupying those lower rungs. And for them, at, at just at a certain point, all the higher positions will be filled. So there's no more incentive for them to to work harder however if you if we flip that on its head and and suddenly everyone owns the means of production even if we're not going to do away with a monetary system entirely um yeah <laughs> uh, uh so even if we're not going to do away with monetary system entirely if, if people are owning the means of production that literally does mean that if they work harder and their company does better that, that directly comes back to them, or at least that profit gets to be directed by them just as equally as it gets to be directed by any other worker. Um, because there's the, we've, we've dissolved the, the um, dualist nature between owner or, or, let's say, just exploiter more generally and exploited. It becomes one thing where everyone is both owner and worker. So in, in, this, in this sort of a, a situation that, that Kropotkin wants to have, everyone in, who is part of an organization gets an equal say on where that profit goes. So as I was saying, now if your company does better, if you uh, introduce innovations, um, if you just configure things in a more you know, efficient way or, or make the workflow better, that literally comes back to you or at least it comes back to you in so much as you can decide where that profit ends up. And, and you know, you can vote for it to, for some of that profit to come to you if everyone gets an equal vote on where profits go. Uh, so, yeah, Perennial Green says, I make a nickel, my boss makes a dime, and that's why. Yeah, basically, you got it. Um, so, yeah, so, so because uh, people are now working for themselves and, and they're seeing the the full product of of their labor uh there's less need for work overall because you know as as we've discussed in in previous chapters the way it is now if you have an an owner um regardless if they're also doing any work or not you may work for say four hours of your day the first half of your day and you've produced enough you know whether it's a good or a service that you're producing Perhaps you've produced enough to pay your own salary. Um, And then the rest of the time, a little bit of that goes to, say, maintenance and, and, you know, future investments and stuff like that. But a big chunk of that goes just straight to the top to be decided how it it gets divvied out. Um, So we're just we're just cutting that all out. You're not working for you know, the, the, the last half or the last third of your entire workday for someone else, those are instead hours that you get for yourself, you know, or you get to, uh, or, or that's the time that you have to come together uh, as needed with your um, fellow workers to make these sorts of decisions, to have these democratic meetings where you decide where, where things go. So he's talking about the, you know, in a, in a, um, communist society as he describes it there's just less need for work and also when you then get to where he wants to be where we're doing away with money entirely and doing production based on need well then you you've you've instead of trying to um make as much of something as you can 
and and then find a price, you know, do price discovery through uh, the markets or whatever. In, instead, we're saying, how much does it take to satisfy the needs of, say, well, let's just take bread. How much grain do we need to grow uh, in order to make bread for the needs of the entire city? Okay, we calculate that out. We, we look at the average number of hours that takes, and, and then we say, okay, you know, wheat producer, you have this many employees. This is about as much as you need to work in order to produce enough wheat for, for your share of, of what's needed. And when you do it that way as well, there's, there's never necessary. There's not, there's not going to be such a glut that, that like, say you have to, uh, do a, a price dump where you, um, or not a price dump, but just literally dump your food because you can't get enough get get a good enough price for it. Okay, there, there's never so much excess that that waste is is occurring. You're you're planning things out, and, and you know you're going to take into account things like like drought and famine and, and other things. Ah, huh. let's see what we have here. So Chloe hates libs. Well, uh, hello to you too. Um, I myself am 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 not super fond of libs. I'm not. Definitely not a, a fan of our current president. Uh, I was begrudgingly forced to, to vote for him because there was no viable alternative, but not a fan of, of basically any of the policies that he's, he's put into place. So I'm with you on that. Hopefully, hopefully you're breaking in the same way that I am. And if not, that, that's cool too, um, as long as you're coming in with an open mind and a willingness to, to learn. Oh, Matthew is here. Okay. <laughs> Well, hello, Matthew. Matthew. Yo. How you doing? Good, man. I'm hanging in there. That's great. Yeah. How's, How's everything? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Just had a 10-hour day of work, pulling weeds and pruning bushes and stuff like that. I've been back into the landscaping lately. So mm -hmm. right. I'm going to try and share my screen with you right now and share the sound as well so we can do this together oops that's not the one i meant to share whoops let me try one let's try that once more boy okay let me do that and we're going to share the computer sound all right are you able to see my screen now yep okay cool that is great all right well uh welcome to the the stream um, I'm very happy to, to have you here. Um, as, as I've mentioned to the audience, uh, you are a permaculture designer and as well as a teacher. Um, but I was wondering if you could uh, give uh, any more of your biography that you feel comfortable and, and willing to, to share. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Matthew Stevens. I'm a, a permaculture designer and educator. Um, I'm also um, an activist and um, an organizer. I would like to see myself as being an organizer um, of uh, information, most most importantly. Um, I took my PDC with Bill uh, and uh, Jeff Lawden, uh, Bill Mollison in 2009 in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and um, I've basically, you know, been doing permaculture uh, ever since. And uh, from Chicago, uh, so a lot of urban, but I, I'm i also itinerant as a designer and a teacher. So uh, been interesting. I uh, created a lot of uh, spaces on um, – Facebook, or some would say colonized a lot of space <laughs> on Facebook, uh, uh, you know, on, on behalf of uh, Bill and the permaculture movement or, 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 you know, the permaculture movement that I um, want to see and um, been working with uh, a lot of different people, uh, you know, in the digital realm to help uh, get this information, uh, Zach you being one of them and one of my favorite people. Oh man, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy what you're, what you've been doing uh, as a content creator. 
Yeah, it's it's been it's been fun. So yeah, thanks for having me, and uh, I I love your show. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, uh, really very educational it. and much yeah, needed. I wish there was more folks doing what you what you're doing. So uh, yeah, keep it up. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And uh, 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 Matthew has a number of different websites. We'll we'll get to those uh, near the end. Um, but he also runs the the largest permaculture group on Facebook with just under 30,000 members. Always cool stuff going on there. And uh, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed being a, an admin for that for the past couple of years now. So yeah. 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 And um, oh, yeah, I also want to, to, to ask you as well. I, I mean, I know Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton pretty well, uh, having uh, studied permaculture for a while, but perhaps the audience is not so familiar with them. So uh, would you mind giving just a, a short little blurb about them as well? Yeah, Bill. Bill is the one of, is who they call the father of permaculture. He's the person that coined the word uh, in his own words. Uh, he said that in the designer's manual. So he's he's he him along with David Holmgren are uh, those are the the co-founders of the permaculture as a system of design. Um, so I took my PDC, I went out to, uh, Australia in 2009 to take my PDC specifically with Bill, Straight from the uh, source. Jeff was, I'm sorry, Straight from, from the, the source. source. Yeah. yeah. From the source. Yeah. I mean, Jeff was a plus because he was, you know, one of the biggest people, biggest names, uh, at that time. But, um, you know, it was, it was great to take that class because I kind of got to see the difference. Uh, between the two, between the teacher and the student, and I um, very quickly chose, you know, Bill mm -hmm. as my uh, sole teacher, actually, uh -huh. uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, have been a devotee um, ever since getting, uh, you know, the 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 sources, uh, the original uh, word word out there. It's kind of been my my calling and I've, re I've received a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pushback and flack and criticism, sure. um, for being so committed to the father of permaculture. Uh, obviously he is, he's the father, so he's, he's kind of the patriarch, uh, and, you know, very easily, you know, not all patriarchs are bad, you know, mm. <laughs> patriarchy <laughs> is bad, but that doesn't make, you know, um, but, you know, Bill is, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I just think uh, he wrote a very important book and uh, he really helped uh, start a very important movement. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I saw that he wasn't getting, um, you know, the acknowledgement, recognition, um, you know, you know, the history of permaculture wasn't being told sure. um, and the book wasn't being taught. So we have this permaculture movement, or it's not, you know, in some ways you could say it's not even a movement um, because there's this lack of uh, historical understanding, mm -hmm. you know, or context. Uh, and then it's also this theoretical foundation, which almost nobody uh, has and understands um, because they didn't get it from the source and they don't even necessarily know what or who, uh, the source is. So, um, so I've had a different approach, you mm -hmm. know, to how I run my groups and kind of spaces I created. And, um, it falls more in line, I think, you know, with, uh, you know, the way the philosophy I think was developed kind of with, uh, an anarchist, um, you know, foundation um along with you know this this ecological um you know awareness mm -hmm. and uh this you know strong sense of design and ethical design which is missing from i think a lot of the the, the hipster permaculturalists <laughs> you know sure. also known as bourgeoisie permaculture yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah i mean i, I myself find a, a lot of overlap between um the way the permaculture is laid out and and various egalitarian practices like like anarchy um just in in the the three ethics themselves you know care for the earth 
it, it's hard to care for the earth if, if your number one care is, is just profit or, you know, increasing right. your bottom line. Uh, care for people. Um, can you really claim to care for people if you're, if you're taking all their money as, as your workers? Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the controversial third ethic, but, but however you want to frame it, uh, bringing back the, the resources or rein, reinvesting the resources into the, the first two ethics. I think right yeah. there, and that, and that to me return says of, mutual aid, basically. Return of surplus, return right? Return of surplus, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Don't take more than your fair share, mm -hmm. set limits to, you know, population and consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and the hipsters hate that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they, they love uh, consuming the lifestyle, you know, getting all the accoutrement yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. just, just to have it for, for their clout, basically. Less work, more consumption. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. All right. Um, are you familiar with this particular book? Have you read The Conquest of Bread before at all? You know, I've I've had it, um, you know, but um, I've read bits and pieces mm -hmm. of Peter. But, um, you know, unfortunately, my lifestyle, uh, you know, being uh, transitory and nomadic, um, I haven't, uh, you know, had an opportunity to keep my studies up the way I normally would. So to be honest with you, uh, ever since, uh, my electricity got cut off in 2015, I mean, I haven't been reading much of anything that's mm. not on a, a digital device. So I have right. had an opportunity to kind of, you know, get, uh, some of Peter through listening to you and I've done, um, a little bit of reading, uh, you know, I would say maybe about five or six years ago, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I kind of found Peter through, you know, just, you know, the, you know, the anarchist network, I think like sure. the, sure. yeah, but I, you know, no, other than, uh, uh you and, and, and the little bit of reading I've been able to do, um, I haven't been able to, you know, really study the way I'd like to. Well, that, that, that's quite all right. You know, I, I get people on the show with all different levels of familiarity with, with the material. But this, this chapter in particular is, is about agriculture. So I think there's going to be a lot of good jumping off points that we can fold in those permaculture ideas and, you know, yeah. apply it to a, a more of a, a, a theory that's, that's relevant to the modern age. You know, one that can even give us hope for, for going forward. Yeah. All right. Uh, so... I think we should get back into the chapter then. And I think I have it on the right one right now. Let me just see for a second. Oh, and let me get your stuff up right here. And oh, did I not put your... All right, I'm just going to get one more thing up on the screen there so that we know who we're talking to. And where's that? There we go. Okay. Right there. Okay. Let me just adjust that for one second and I'll be ready to go. And so uh, the way I usually do it, Matthew, is, is anytime you, you feel like stopping, just let me know. Um, you should be hearing the, the audio from the, the YouTube video through the Skype call. Um, so anytime you want to stop, just let me know and, and we'll, we'll go from there. And, um, mm -hmm. this is a longer chapter. Usually uh, it goes about the way it goes is, uh, I try to do a two hour show and that, that usually covers about 20 minutes a book. And this particular chapter is, is twice that long. So we may only get through half of it tonight and we may have to turn it into a, a two parter thing. So just, to, just to let you know kind of where, where I'm headed there. All right. Uh, are you ready to, to get going with the chapter then? Yep. All right. Let's get into it. Uh, do you want me to start it over again, or do you want to just kind of jump in where we're at? No, just jump in, man. All right. Let's keep going then. Each time agriculture is spoken of, men imagine a peasant bending over the plow, throwing badly assorted corn haphazard into the ground, and waiting anxiously for what the good or bad season will bring forth. They think of a family working from morn to night and reaping as reward a rude bed, dry bread, and a coarse beverage. In a word, they picture the savages of La Bruyere. 
and for these men, ground down to such a misery, the utmost relief that society proposes is to reduce their taxes or their rent. But even the most social reformers do not care to imagine a cultivator standing erect, taking leisure, and producing by a few hours work per day sufficient food to nourish not only his own family, but a hundred men more at least. In their most glowing dreams of the future, socialists do not go beyond American extensive culture, which, after all, is but the infancy of agricultural art. But the thinking agriculturalist has broader ideas today. His conceptions are on a far grander scale. He only asks for a fraction of an acre in order to produce sufficient vegetables for a family, and to feed 25 horned beasts he needs no more space than he formerly required to feed one. His aim is to make his own soil, to defy seasons and climate, to warm both air and earth around the young plant, to produce, in a word, on one acre what he used to gather from 50 acres, and that without any excessive fatigue, by greatly reducing on the contrary the total of former labor. He knows that he will be able to feed everybody by giving to the culture of the fields no more time than what each can give with pleasure and joy. This is the present tendency of agriculture. While scientific men, led by Liebig, the creator of the chemical theory of agriculture, often got on the wrong... Oh my goodness. All right, just want to stop it right there. Um, so with, with permaculture, they, they talk about a lot of the same sorts of, of things where, I mean, uh, the idea that you can even boost production above and beyond what uh, modern-day conventional agriculture can produce by having many different crops on, on one in one area, and then also using the, the vertical space as well. Um, what, what has been your experience, Matthew, with, with the, the comparative yields of, of permaculture um, operations that you've seen compared to like what you, you know, what a, a conventional agriculture operation might produce? Yeah, okay, so most of the permaculture uh, systems I've seen have been less than, um, you know, ideal uh, from their design. Sure. Uh, often, you know, as a result of what hippie syndrome or hipster syndrome or some type of, you know, misunderstanding. But they always, you know, do better than the agriculturalists, at least in uh, spirit. And um, that, you know, I think generally, yeah, we're, we're talking about gardening. Mm -hmm. So the systems are always smaller, you know, and more relatable for, um, you know, feeding uh, individual people a diverse uh, diet that doesn't, you know, require, um, you know, as I think what Bill says it's mechanized, you know, industrial um, agriculture, right, where you need these big machines in order to even uh, start, which requires capital, which right. requires a capitalist. So, but yeah, I mean, that, uh, from listening to that, uh, absolutely, you know, um, you know, I could see uh, why Peter is referenced um, so often, or even kind of like under the radar mm -hmm. and under the table, and kind of in the back rooms, like the mainstream, you know, hipster permaculture people aren't talking about, you know, Peter Kropotkin, but <laughs> they, um, you know, the people who really know and, you know, might have, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, politically sensible, um, you know, ideas are going to, you know, I think automatically um, find themselves uh, reading Peter and then... Um, yeah, when you hear, you know, uh, you know, like what we just heard, mm -hmm. uh, creating a warm air and warm soil. Well, I mean, okay, in mm -hmm. permaculture, say, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're going to create microclimate, right? And that's what he, that's what you know what he's talking about. And then also, um, you know, what else? Uh, what else did he say? Um, he was talking about, you know. Uh, we'll, we'll use just a, a fraction of an acre, mm -hmm. okay, uh, which obviously means gardening or, um, you know, very, a small scale agriculture without question, because, you know, like, you know, the standard in America is the five acre farm. So if we're talking about a fraction of an acre, we're talking about, um, 
you know, small, small scale agriculture. So, and then what else did he say? Um, you know, he, he, and then he talked about, well, I guess the, the Mollison principle that comes to mind, um, and in relation to, you know, this section of the book that you played Mm -hmm. is the, um, the principle where he says, you know, the limit to yield, yield is theoretically unlimited, is limited only by the information and the imagination of the designer. And, you know, I like to translate imagination to creativity and that when we're, you know, basically working class or poor people, Mm -hmm. um, indigenous people or people that lack, you know, um, the resources that they need have to, you know, be observant and they have to be creative, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in order to make things work. And then you find that creative um, kind of ingenuity at the grassroots level with these uh, small, you know, doing exactly what you said, which is uh, going vertically and then, uh, you know, growing uh, in polyculture, which is what you said, have a bunch of things growing. Um, and that's a kind of a horticultural um, forest gardening mm-hmm. approach. Right. And it's also just an approach for, you know, basically subsistence uh, food. Because if you're going to do subsistence food, you know, you need a diversity of food growing because you're never going to just subsist off of, uh, you know, potatoes. Um, right. I mean, you're going to grow a substantial amount of potatoes, but that's you're not going to be the only thing you're going to do. Right. Um, yeah. So, so a lot of people might see that that if you're doing a whole bunch of different things, and um, never enough to to really mechanize it, that some people might look at that and say, "Well, isn't that going to be a whole lot more, you know, hand labor? Am I just going to be sweating out in the field like like the peasants of old?" Or, or, or what? Like, what, what is permaculture's answer to that sort of a concern? Well, if you're sweating out in the fields, you're sweating, you're sweating out in the, you know, you're doing agriculture. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you got a field, you know, and, and you don't got no trees. Right. Yeah. You know, to give you some shade and give your plants some shade. Well, yeah, you're going to be working hard watering. You're going to be working hard drinking water. And you're going to be, uh, if it's a field, you're going to be bending over, uh, you know, and hurting your back. Of course, you're going to be working with tools because, you know, that's what, you know, you have to do to do anything. Uh, you know, if you work with uh, power tools or, uh, you know, vehicles that run off of uh, uh, fuel, mm-hmm. specifically non-renewable fuel, you're going to have to, uh, you know, work in order to get that fuel. Right. Uh, so permaculture is like, yeah, let's not do too much work mm-hmm. and let's do work that we can that we can do with our hands and with hand tools and that we we can uh, feed ourselves with the, the produce that we produce. And basically that we can fuel the work with food, not oil. And then, you mm-hmm. know, on top of that, um, you know, we design the system to minimize work so yeah we got to do some work but no any good permaculture designer is not going to be toiling away in a field and you're not even going to have a field in a permaculture (laughs) system so you know that's the you know that's trauma uh from you know if you're a person of color you know from like you know the, the slave old days uh, from the stories of our ancestors, from you know, uh, you know, seeing the media, and that's just in the genes from the fact that it actually happened, um, and with the whole police uh, state, you know, and racism with its brutality. So that's that. And then you know, uh, for the for the bourgeoisie, mm-hmm. well, yeah, want to you know, sit in their nice, you know houses you know and they don't want to get dirty at all just like the hipsters so it's more of a class uh thing yeah. you know for them and you know they just won't they won't eat <laughs> just, that's, just, that's just the consequence of, it kind of defeats the purpose of, of doing permaculture at all if, if you're not going to get anything from I mean, it you gotta, we got to do some work yeah. permaculture is probably sure. the best 
because we're not going to do any more work than we really have to. And we're going to get that work done out the way um, in the beginning. And we're going to put our time and energy into the designing. So right. our work is minimized over the long term. Right. Right. You and know? and uh, uh, Holmgren's uh, concept of, of small and slow solutions. Right. So you, mm -hmm. you, do, you do a lot of stuff up front and uh, it, it might take a while for things to, to start to kind of mimic an ecosystem and, and get into a, a natural uh, dynamic equilibrium with each other. But but eventually, right, the idea is that you're not spraying chemicals because you have the natural uh, bugs or, or predators or whatever to, to keep the various pests at least somewhat in check, right? So, mm -hmm. and then, then also because you're, you're not doing just one crop, uh, you're doing a, a whole bunch of different stuff. You can't get such an investation that it, it wipes out your entire thing, which, which uh, itself builds resilience into the system, you know? You don't, you don't have just one really bad year of a particular pest and, and no farmer in your entire region makes anything off of it, right? There's always a backup, right? Yeah, when we, when we, when we, uh, when we do agriculture, uh, when we do monoculture, we, we are doing all the work and uh, everybody's coming to eat, you know, everybody who eats, you know, whatever we, the one thing that we choose to eat. Right. Uh, they I'm going to eat too. And then, you know, you, you basically got the same situation in the agricultural field that you have uh, in the forest. If you try to go live in the forest, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, one of the things Bill says is stay out of the bush. <laughs> it's already in good order. That means there's an, already a bunch of people living there, mm -hmm. you know, so don't go there because they've already got it working just fine. We're the ones that are running around destroying stuff. So, in this field, we've basically destroyed all natural eco, you know, ecology. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, we've created an opportunity for uh, infestation by, uh, you know, right. basically destroying that fabric that keeps uh, the ecosystem, um, you know, stable. Basically, right. in the designer's manual, it says what? You know, w without diversity, there can be no stability right absolutely yep. uh i think it was it was bill who said it um that everything gardens right everything gardens that's another bill principle right yeah. so so you were just you're just one piece of, of the ecology that you're building you, you are you are an actor within a, a broader system but you're not the only actor you know you have all these different organisms that are all playing their role um mm -hmm. and um as, as modern ecology bears out, there's, there's a whole lot more collaboration happening within nature than, than previously thought. Like people used to talk about the law of the jungle, how everything was just, you know, survival of the fittest. One thing attacks and destroys another, the strong defeat the weak, all, on and on and on. But what we find more often than not is, is collaboration in one form or another. I mean, once you cut down the tree, right, but mm -hmm. you still got to put on a hat afterwards yep you don't you have still the shade anymore yeah but the tree is the commons you know everybody in that ecosystem you know go brunch to that tree for shelter at some point or to you know eat or to get a bird's eye view mm -hmm. um you know so that tree is a very important part of the ecosystem and then you the invasive species once you come in and cut down a tree because you have an insatiable appetite for wood or just domination of, you know, the feminine, you know, uh, the, the, of the earth, of the mother. Um, you know, you just, you know, humans are motherfuckers, right? <laughs> can yeah. I say that on here? Or is that yeah, you, you, can say, you can say swears. Uh, the only thing that you can't say on, on Twitch is, is slurs of any kind. But you, slurs. You, well, slurs. Yeah. So, you know, like uh, uh, racial epithets or, or ableist right, right. language, stuff like that. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We, Good, yeah. Other than that, we can use the, the full flower. Keep up the great work, which <laughs> we're, we're going to migrate over well, everybody over from Facebook to Twitch. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of opportunity for, for teaching to be going on live, you know, and you can, yeah. it's, it's, it's a really easy thing to get into. Um, you can set it up so all your followers ha get notified every time you go live and, mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, it's once you once you figure out the the technology, which you know, I I, I watched a few fifteen minute tutorials on on YouTube, and I was pretty well up to speed on on how to to do all the streaming stuff, and then you're just basically good to go. And, yeah, it's and, great. And you, you know, you can easily share your screen with your audience, pull up anything you want from the internet. At some point, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the the designer's manual um, on the stream and just read through it page by page. Maybe you'd like to, to join me for that as well. In the future. Yeah, man. And you should maybe get Poncho to come on too. Oh, he Poncho has, would be great as well. Yeah. He has this hipster cam, man. He has a hipster cam that you can put on your desk. Uh-huh. And it aims down. So he he's <laughs> flipping through the manual. Man, yeah, it'd be it'd be great. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get one of those. So cool. Yeah, yeah. Get all the oh. permaculture friends on to to go through that. But that yeah, I think it's really Really vital stuff for for anyone who's interested in permaculture. Start with start with the designer's manual. I would say, because that, that yeah. covers just so much of the ground that like you know you're gonna be at least eighty percent of the way there and and understanding. Um, I tell people to start with the designer's manual and work backwards. Backwards through time. the chapters. Well, backwards in time. So uh. like. Well, the way I teach my courses is, I, you know, I focus on the designer's manual and I go up to basically to Introduction to Permaculture by Bill, mm -hmm. the book, which was 1990. Then, I, then I, I'll mention Earth uh, User's Guide to Permaculture by Rosemary Morrow. Oh, yeah, that's and a then, good one. And then I'll mention what the... Uh, the uh, Permaculture uh, permaculture design course with Bill in 19, I think it was 94, 96. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And then every, you basically, I'm really focusing on the books that was published before 1988, all going all the way back to Farmers uh, for 40 Centuries by F.H. King. So my students get this historical, you know, uh, record of the books that really created the foundation for permaculture to come into uh, into being, mm -hmm. like Tree Crops or Permanent Agriculture or Silent Spring yeah. by Rachel Carson That's or good, yeah. Limits to Grow, Small is Beautiful, you know, uh, Agricultural Testament. Yeah. Would you include uh, Holmgren's uh, permaculture principles and pathways beyond sustainability? I don't, I don't just because it was published in 2003. So it's it was a post uh, millennial book. Um, I mean, I would as a reference, sure, but not from a historical not as an essential text necessarily. You know, I mean, I'm not going to go that far. Okay. You know, I just, you know. We got this thing of like, you know, Bill really kind of holding it down for those 20, yeah. those kind of 20 years from 1979 to 1999. And then like 2003, Holmgren, you know, I'm going to just say finally published his book. Um, and, you know, so that's a long period. That's a 20 year period where mm -hmm. Holmgren... He published what you know the Flywire House book, which I would I would include right where I wouldn't include Principles and Pathways, I would include you know the Flywire uh, House book and like the Meliodora book or whatever he that he published. So those two texts I would. Okay. But yeah, I mean, if anything, Holmgren would be the cutoff. Okay. Right. Where anything after that uh, principles and pathways, I would say, you know, absolutely not, because these are the formative years of that permaculture concept. But by default, anything that Holmgren publishes, you know, has to be recognized because he's a, he's one of you the co-founders. Yeah. One of the co-founders, you know, but I'm a little, you know, a little partial to Bill. <laughs> yeah, you don't like me, you know, because I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, but that, that I, I think because once, one thing is, is Holmgren is still, you know, writing his, um, you know, he's still writing his books, so he can write, you know, two, three, as many more books as he wants, right. uh, and really kind of shape uh, permaculture in his life, 
but I mean, obviously, Bill's not, uh, you know, Bill's not going to be doing that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Sad, sad to to hear of his passing back in 2016. But man, he he lived a, a good long life, and he <laughs> he got as much as he could out of it. So, yeah, yeah. Bill was a beast, man. Yeah, he was a beast. Sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. All right. Well, let's continue on in the chapter a little bit and see what else they, they have to say about uh, agriculture. So, so Kropotkin at this point is, is talking about his idea that that uh, I, I guess mechanization is, is going to to help the worker more than anything, cut down in hours. And as, whereas we're coming at it almost from the opposite perspective that uh, you know, good design and um, just thinking of things in in a different way is is what's really going to be the 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 labor saver and and also at the same time um a a lower barrier to entry for the average uh, uh producer i guess we'll call them um which you know it, it if permaculture becomes more of the norm and it uh, uh spreads out into the countryside and and becomes more common it, it will require more workers. So that's that could be a huge opportunity for people to have jobs that uh, they find more fulfilling, um, that, that bring them closer to the land that, that they depend on, that we all depend on. Um, so, you know, whereas machinery tends to destroy jobs, doing permaculture seems to, to kind of do the opposite. It's very, very job creating. All right, well, let's, let's continue on with the, with the chapter here. Strong tack and their love of mere theories, unlettered agriculturalists opened up new roads to prosperity. Market gardeners of Paris, Troyes, Rouen, Scotch and English gardeners, Flemish and Lombardian farmers, peasants of Jersey, Guernsey, and farmers of the Scilly Isles have opened up such large horizons that the mind hesitates to grasp them. While up till lately, a family of peasants needed at least 17 to 20 acres to live on the produce of the soil, and we know how peasants live, we can no longer say what is the minimum area on which all that is necessary to a family can be grown, even including articles of luxury, if the soil is worked by means of intensive culture. Twenty years ago, it could already be asserted that a population of 30 million individuals could live very well without importing anything on what could be grown in Great Britain. But now... When we see the progress recently made in France, in Germany, in England, and when we contemplate the new horizons which open before us, we can say that in cultivating the earth as it is already cultivated in many places, even on poor soils, 50 or 60 million inhabitants to the territory of Great Britain would still be a very feeble proportion to what man could extract from the soil. In any case, as we are about to demonstrate, we may consider it as absolutely proved that if tomorrow Paris and the two departments of Seine and of seine et organized themselves as an anarchist commune in which all worked with their hands, and if the entire universe refused to send them a single bushel of wheat, a single head of cattle, a single basket of fruit, and left them only the territory of the two departments, they could not only produce all the corn, meat, and vegetables necessary for themselves, but also the vegetables and fruit, which are now articles of luxury in sufficient quantities for all. And, in addition, we affirm that the sum total of this labor would be far less than that expended at present to feed these people with corn harvested in Auvergne and Russia, with vegetables produced a little everywhere by extensive agriculture, and with fruit grown in the south. It is self-evident that we in no wise desired all exchange to be suppressed, nor that each region should strive to produce that which will only grow in its climate by a more or less artificial culture. But we care to draw attention to the fact that the theory of exchange, such as is understood today, is strangely exaggerated, that exchange is often useless and even harmful. We assert, moreover, that people have never had a right conception of the immense labor of southern wine growers, nor that of Russian and Hungarian corn growers, whose excessive labor could also be very much reduced if they adopted intensive culture instead of their present system of extensive agriculture. Part 2 it would be impossible to quote here the mass of facts on which we base. Before we get into to part two, was there, was there any other thoughts that, that came up for you as we were going through that past, that little bit there? I mean, I know he was uh, 
mostly talking about um, stuff of his time that may not be too relevant today. Yeah, well, okay, so he, what were some of the things that took up for you? Um, um, basically, he was just talking, I, I, again, I think he's just elaborating more on, on um, the idea of, of both uh, newer technology coming in to, to help things uh, with the average worker, and then also the idea uh, that we had talked a little bit about on the stream before you joined us, that um, if, if people are, are owning the product of their labor and they're not having to work extra to pay a landlord or, or a boss or an owner or anything like that, um, that conceivably they have to work a lot less, right? Does, does that make sense at all? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Of course. Well, I mean, you're carrying the, you know, the the, the needs and greeds of, of, you know, Mr. Charlie or uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Landlord, you know, whichever one, you know, works for you. So, you know, um, what was one of the things that uh, he said? One was, uh, you know, uh, exchange, you know, he kind of like implied that like exchange can actually be a bad thing. Right. Um, like exchange, and I think, you know, Bill would, you know, kind of like say exchange for exchange sake, or uh, even the, the idea of like, you know, to, to, he says somewhere in chapter 14, he's like, you know, we could, we could still under, you know, communism and Mondragon cooperatives, you know, pr produce too much. Right. And could be over pollute. Yeah, pollute the, the world and basically kill everything off, like, you know, production being the bottom line. So I would say, yeah, I mean, you know, I think when we say set limits to population and consumption, well, as a designer, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, the ideal, and you'll find this with the, you know, the, 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 you know, the super hipsters mm -hmm. who are often hippie, hippie hoarders. Or like like the fundamentalists, the real fascists, right? Who, yeah. you know, they won't want you to have any plastic whatsoever. Now I'm like, I don't want any plastic coming onto the site, mm -hmm. okay? But if the, the if it's the design, uh, there are certain things that I use that have that are made of plastic. You know, a five gallon bucket, for example. Sure. Okay, it's made of plastic. I'm going to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. I use environmental. Yeah. Composter, right. it's made of plastic. Rain barrel, mm -hmm. right? Certain type of rain barrel, but you know, it's still it's made of plastic. Now the design of the component is what I care about. It, is it a quality design? Is it going to last a long time? Then, you know, um, so that's an import. I'm bringing that in from off of the site. Right. But you know, uh, I'm not going to just buy compost from somebody that's local because they're local, you know, I'm going to get, uh, the best soil that I can. And I think that's where, um, you know, like basically, no, we don't want to just because someone's in our community, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't want to do business with them. We want to do business with the people who are, you know, making an eth an ethical product. And if a plastic product you know, keeps you from cutting down trees and keeps you from wasting water mm -hmm. uh, and like these type of things, you know, then from a permaculture standpoint, you know, I think it's it's a wise investment, especially in a world where, you know, finding good business partners mm -hmm. um, and good products are, uh, Can be hard. you know, it's, it's getting hard. Sure. So, so I look for people and products, you know, that wouldn't fall in, un, in line with the, the ultra purist mm -hmm. uh, permaculture idealist, uh, you know, that I would like to be. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, invest heavily in organic things, uh, you know, uh, if I got the money like plants and trees and bricks and things like that, you know, that are uh, kind of like just, uh, you know, they're not they're gonna, not going to do any harm to right. the environment. And then when I go into the industrial uh, design world, you know, I'm being very, very critical. But once I find uh, a good product that does what I need to do, I'm happy to throw 
uh, money at it, you know, and get those products you know, into a site, into a project, into a design. So, you know, there's really uh, no reason, you know, it's like, how many trees do I need to get on the site, you know, to make it stable? How many Mm -hmm. many hoses, how many quality hoses, how many hose nozzles, how many rain tanks? These are the industrial things. How many watering cans, you know, to make it able to become an eco village because mm-hmm. you, you're going to need an abundance of these things and if you don't have them you're going to find yourself uh you know cutting down trees and you're not going to be planting a whole lot of them but you got enough water cans you can start a nursery for sure yeah yeah, yeah. I, I really like um all those things you're saying about um considering the the ecology and, and the long term um harms or, or costs of, of the, the products that you use and, and uh, the methods that you use and, and that sort of thing and, and getting away from the idea that, that just because something is, is perhaps local that it's it's necessarily good. And I, I think that's that's the, the one of the real things that that uh, permaculture has to offer to uh, these these anarchist sort of movements is, is these considerations for uh, the long term really, you know, the sustainability of, of, of everything. Um, that it's, it's, it's not good enough as, as you say, just to, to yeah. think of, about, you know, I mean, it's good for people if, if everything is, it gets to be a cooperative or, you know, um, a, a worker owned, uh, and managed endeavor. But, you know, like you said, that, that alone doesn't provide for future needs and future generations. So I think that's where permaculture is really vital to, to, to bring into these ideas. You got to have the ethics because, mm-hmm. If I'm if if you and I are working together and there's another guy in town and he's you know in the business mm-hmm. right of making compost and wood chip and stuff you know but uh, he allows for his stuff to become contaminated and he contaminates the local ecosystem as a result you know now um, we're complicit in the pollution of our local environment and I think that's where uh, you know, like I've worked with permaculture, hipster permaculture designers, and I call them that because, you know, they're doing work for people and, you know, they're, uh, you know, throwing cardboard, sheet mulching, right? Just a permaculture strategy, mm-hmm. um, you know, questionable, you know, to some degree, hmm. right? Uh, you know, depending on how it's being done. Right. Right. Is it UV coated? Is it does it got heavy metals? You know, because if you're using heavy metal, you know, UV coated high gloss. Oh, yeah. You know, That's hipster cardboard boxes. OK, now you're yeah. contaminating the soil. If you don't take the, the cellophane tape off. That too. Yeah. And I've worked with people. They just throw it down with the tape on and stuff like that. And, and like... I'm working for them. Oh, so geez. they're the boss. Yeah. So they and me. And I'm like, I'm like, I ain't doing that. And but they looking at the time. They looking at like, well, we got to get in and get this done. I'm paying you. I want, you know. I'm like, I don't, <laughs> you know. And so this is why I'm telling you, there's a lot of uh, hipsters, especially in California. But I mean, I'm going to tell you, like, you know, all over in Canada, uh, California. Mm-hmm. We got them here in Chicago. They're in, uh, uh, you know, on the East Coast, all up and down the East Coast, you know, Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, Nashville. Yeah. And, uh, you know. All over the place. All over the place. Texas. Come on. Colorado. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's bad in the U.S. especially, but all over the world. And so, you know, you know. These folks give permaculture a bad name because, you know, basically you're doing 180 degree, you know, you're turning something in that's supposed to be sustainable and you're, uh, you know, it becomes a problem. And I, you know, you you got a lot of the hippie types and the hipster types, you know, which there's too much fashion, not enough science, not enough integrity. And basically in, in the first chapter of the book, you know, the this, this section on ethics, it says an ethic, the ethical basis mm-hmm. of permaculture. 
So. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're just, uh, they're concerned about their brand and, and, and making a profit more than doing the actual work in, in a permaculture way. Yeah, yeah, which is taking off the cellophane tape right. and sort through the <laughs> cardboard. Minimum. You know, at a bare at a bare minimum, yeah. if you can't do that, it's like you know, we don't need you, we don't want you, please. Yeah. You know, you, and these are the same, same people who say, well, "I don't use the word permaculture." Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and so never please, distance yourself, never, please. Yeah. yeah, never use it. <laughs> In fact, tell people that this is not permaculture. Right. Speak explicitly. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's continue on a little bit more here. Base our assertions. We are therefore obliged to refer our readers who want further information to another book, fields, factories, and workshops. Above all, we earnestly invite those who are interested in the question to read several excellent works published in France and elsewhere, and of which we give a list at the close of this book. As to the inhabitants of large towns who have as yet no real notion of what agriculture can be, we advise them to explore the surrounding market gardens. They need but observe and question the market gardeners, and a new world will be open to them. They will then be able to see what European agriculture may be in the 20th century, and they will understand with what force the social revolution will be armed when we know the secret of taking everything we need from the soil. A few facts will suffice to show that our assertions are in no way exaggerated. We only wish them to be preceded by a few general remarks. We know in what a wretched condition European agriculture is. If the cultivator of the soil is not plundered by the landowner, he is robbed by the state. If the state taxes him moderately, the moneylender enslaves him by the means of promissory notes, and soon turns him into the simple tenant of soil belonging in reality to a financial company. The landlord, the state, and the banker thus plunders the cultivator by means of rent, taxes, and interest. The sum varies in each country, but it never falls below the quarter, very often the half, of the raw produce. In France and in Italy, agriculturalists paid the state quite recently as much as 44% of the gross produce. Moreover, the share of the owner and of state always goes on increasing. As soon as the cultivator has obtained more plentiful crops by prodigies of labor, invention, or initiative, the tribute he will owe to the landowner, the state, and the banker will augment in proportion. If he doubles the number of bushels reaped per acre, rent will be doubled, and taxes too, and the state will take care to raise them still more if the prices go up, and so on. In short, everywhere the cultivator of the soil works 12 to 16 hours a day, these three vultures take from him everything he might lay by. They rob him everywhere of what would enable him to improve his culture. This is why agriculture progresses so slowly. The cultivator can only occasionally make some progress, in some exceptional regions, under quite exceptional circumstances, following upon a quarrel between the three vampires. And yet, we have said nothing about the tribute every cultivator pays to the manufacturer. Every machine, every spade, every barrel of chemical manure is sold to him at three or four times its real cost. Nor let us forget the middleman, who levies the lion's share of the earth's produce. This is why during all this century of invention and progress, agriculture is only improved from time to time on very limited areas. Happily, there have always been small oases neglected for some time by the vulture, and here we learn what intensive agriculture can produce for mankind. Let us mention a few examples. In the American prairies, which, however, only yield meager spring wheat crops from 7 to 15 bushels acre, and even these are often marred by periodical droughts, 500 men, working only during 8 months, produce the annual food of 50,000 people. With all the improvements of the last three years, one man's yearly labor, 300 days, yields, delivered in Chicago as flour, the yearly food of 250 men. Here the result is obtained by a great economy in manual labor. On those vast plains, plowing, harvesting, thrashing are organized in almost military fashion. There is no useless running to and fro, no loss of time. All is done with parade-like precision. This is agriculture on a large scale, extensive agriculture, which takes the soil from nature without seeking to improve it. When the earth has yielded all it can, they leave it. They seek elsewhere for a virgin soil to be exhausted in its turn. But here is also intensive agriculture, which is already worked, and will be more and more so by machinery. Its object is to cultivate a limited space well, to manure, to improve, 
to concentrate work and to obtain the largest crop possible. This kind of culture spreads every year, and whereas agriculturalists in the south of France and on the fertile plains of Western America are content with an average crop of 11 to 15 bushels per acre by extensive culture, they reap regularly 37, even 55, and sometimes 60 bushels per acre in the north of France. The annual consumption of man is thus obtained from less than a quarter of an acre. And the more intense the culture is, the less work is expended to obtain a bushel of wheat. Machinery replaces man at the preliminary work, and for the improvements needed by the land, such as draining, clearing of stones, which will double the crops in future, once and forever. Sometimes, nothing but keeping the soil free of weeds without manuring allows an average soil to yield excellent crops from year to year. It has been done for forty years in succession at Rothamsted and Hertfordshire. However, let us not... All right, we can just uh, pause it there for a second. Um, so, kind of a, a, a tangential issue, I guess, or a side issue that, that I was kind of thinking about as he was talking about these extensive operations is I don't hear much in, in permaculture about uh, how, to, how to provide for, say, like the staple crops, you might say, like, you know, your corn, your wheat, your stuff like that. Permaculture doesn't seem really well adapted if we're doing a little bit of this a little bit of that so well, what what has been your experience what when people ask like you know where do i get my where do i get my bread from stuff like that like how, how do we do it if we're not doing things extensively and we're not monocropping um yeah okay so that's i think that's a good question you know where's okay one is diet right mm-hmm. health diet what is healthy um you know, and we're talking about agriculture, well, permaculture is, you know, not really agriculture. I mean, you know, it's different than modern agriculture Absolutely. and monocrop, mono mm-hmm. you know, agriculture. So what is permaculture? Uh, and then so I think, one, you got to, uh, okay, so we got to go back to that book. We were talking about Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith. Uh, the subtitle is a permanent agriculture Mm -hmm. and the book is about trees uh, and uh, permaculture is, uh, you know, trees that actually produce a fruit of some sort, uh, you know, a crop. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, you know, staples, the potatoes and the wheat, Mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, um, you know, I think in permaculture, you know, that is not what we're looking for for staples. We're not looking for one staple. We're looking for a a diverse diet and we're looking for a sustainable diet. Like I think first we want diversity and we want sustainability so we can we can, I think, say scientifically that agriculture is not sustainable. Yeah, I mean, he, he was talking even even back then how they they were doing things so extensively that they were just you know mining the soil for for nutrients, mining, using it up, and 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 you know things have not changed all that much since since then. We lose what is it like a, a quarter inch of, of topsoil on average every year. So that's. You know, for seven billion people now. Yeah, yeah, for a lot more people. There That's was... what made seven billion possible. Right. It's not uh, sustainable over the long term. So, if you know, if we know that scientifically, then you know what? What did Einstein supposedly say? You know, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it, or something it, yeah. like that. Okay. So permaculture, where we're at this crossroads where we have to decide, you know, uh, this is post, you know, um, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Mm -hmm. post, you know, uh, World War II, uh, you know, post, um, you know, a whole whole lot of things, right? Uh, You know, so... Uh, Fukushima, ex, uh, the BP oil spill, mm-hmm. you know, 
all of these species that are going extinct, uh, extinct, all of these, all this deforestation, mm -hmm. you know, we have a choice. Is it going to be to basically keep doing what we've been doing and, you know, try to perfect agriculture in hopes that, you know, it will at some point work. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Even if it's never really worked <coughs> or, are we going to, you know, uh, try something new, try something different, or even try something old, which is, you know, permaculture, which is going back to um, what we know to be sustainable, which is natural systems, indigenous systems, mm -hmm. small scale systems, diverse systems, soil building systems, mm -hmm. uh, polyculture systems. Uh, you know, there's the article by the, you know, uh, I think it's the Guardian, you know, uh, you know, small scale agriculture, you know, the only thing that can uh, save the planet or save the world. OK, so the key is small. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about small, we're talking about, you know, a limited number of uh, a, of acres or space or hectares land, um, square meters. Well, how small is that? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when we start thinking about, well, how much food does one person need? Well, you know, that's the kind of questions I asked after I took my PDC. You know, I asked Bill, you know, uh, when I was at his house, you know, I was like, what can I ask this man that, you know, you know, here's an opportunity of a lifetime, yeah, right? for sure. You know, let me not waste it. Well, I said, okay, fuck it. I said, hey, Bill, how many trees do I need to plant to feed myself for the rest of my life? Uh -huh. You know, and the best thing I could come up with right at that time. Um, and he said, I think he said 20, 20, 20. Yeah. He said 20 trees. Wow. 20, 20 trees. And I'm good. I'm retired. So the fight has been to plant those 20. I've heard him in the recording say 12. I mean, how many, how many would you say? <coughs> um, excuse me. I, you know, I don't really know. I've never, I've never really calculated that out. My, my, my focus has always just been in more than we have now, <laughs> really. Uh, right, right. But then, but then, you know, you want to know how far off, because if we want to take our fair share uh -huh. and we want to return a surplus, <clears throat> well, you know, when are we get in surplus ballpark, right? Right. And I mean, it depends on your diet. That's true. That's true. How much fruit are you going to eat? I mean, if you're a cowboy and you want to eat, you know, uh, you know, meat three times a day. Well, you know, I mean, that's just not going to happen worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you want to, if you want, you want to eat bacon for breakfast, uh -huh. you know, uh, what's for lunch? <laughs> I don't know. Salmon. Yeah. Okay. Or chicken. Salmon or chicken and hamburgers. Uh, or, you know, some type of game for, for dinner, you know, you're going to need, I mean, you're going to need some, some space for that. But if we're, you know, when we can figure out how much that is, you know, I mean, really just by mm -hmm. figuring out how many pounds <clears throat> of each meat and, you know, there's going to be an industrial one and then there's, you know, scale, which is going to be a smaller space, more energy intensive. And then there's going to be a larger space for the, you know, wild game and, you know, um, free range and so forth and so on. But then once we get to, you know, basically a plant based diet or a vegan diet, um, you know, we can it's easier to quantify that because mm -hmm. it's. It's basically a simpler system, maybe not necessarily in terms of ecology, uh, but right. because, you know, we have more diversity with, uh, you know, uh, the plants. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, basically for us, we just needed a scale in the garden just to kind of measure. And then you keep track of your inputs, how much mm -hmm. compost you're bringing in, how much wood chips you're bringing <clears throat> in, and how many plants are you planting. And then you just keep the annuals and the perennials separate but from a permaculture standpoint you know you gotta you know consider it's you know a perennial agriculture or a permanent agriculture which basically means perennial mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So we're going to be planting fruit trees. We're going to be planting berry bushes. We're going to be planting things that basically are going to come plant once, and they're going to be sticking around for, you know, five to ten to twenty to you know fifty to a hundred or more right. years. Right. That's the permanent, you know, attribute aspect. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about agriculture, right? I think that's the one thing like people you know, get, they don't get about permaculture. They don't understand. People don't teach it. And so, you know, there's this gardening aspect, which is a small aspect. It's a home gardening aspect. It's like he was talking about market gardens, right? Well, right. market garden is a part of permaculture, you know, but, you know, it's not uh, more important than home garden. Right? Right. Got to have a home. Everybody got to have a home guard. Everybody, everybody got to produce something. To produce something. Yeah. Eastern herb spiral. You know, and a couple of keyhole beds. You know, because that's really, you know, what it was Bill saying. You know, you only need fifty square meters, which is like five hundred square feet. Well, I think that's probably about right, because if. My hunch is for a vegan, you, you know, if if you got 500 plants, mm -hmm. you're good. Because you could take, you know, a leaf off of every one of those plants. Sure. And you'll probably get, you know, five pounds or something like that. I don't know. Right. You know, but you can measure that. Mm -hmm. I've tried. Um, we had 2,000 square feet at Cheryl's garden mm -hmm. and um, when we were putting water on it uh, and bringing in the compost, we had, uh, I, she was giving me bags of food too, like two or three bags of food a week from that garden uh, and I couldn't eat it all. I had to start cooking <laughs> immediately upon walking in the door and I was tired from working in the garden. Yeah. So. It was like, okay, now we got to do the real work, which is, you know, cooking all this food and eating it because I know in 48 hours it's going to happen again. So granted, this is in Chicago, so the winter is not taken into consideration, mm -hmm. but that can easily be measured with, uh, you know, a couple of freezers uh, and just yeah. basically putting away some of that produce, <clears throat> half of it. Winter. Yeah. But 2,000 square feet, I would say, is probably um, for a cold climate, you know, it might it probably enough for one person. Wow. With compost uh, and wood chips and being brought in and plants, like, you know, so you, you, you're not counting the nursery or the space that it takes to sure. make the compost. But we also have our own compost there and there's also you know there was a picnic table where you can sit at so it, it also functioned as a community space as a learning space so forth and so on so for a tropical environment i think you know in order to produce everything i wanted i think i calculated about ten thousand square feet and oh, that includes for a tropical oh. well that's because we're you know i mean basically uh this garden, this 2,000 square foot garden, is not in really including uh, fruit trees. Oh, okay. We had a couple. We had fruit trees, but this was really uh, more mixed. So hmm. I'd say like two or three or four fruit trees with a couple of wildlife trees. Then we'd have, uh, you know, like a bunch of raspberries. Mm -hmm. uh, as it became more perennial, you know, I think the space was too small so i think you you need more space uh when you're doing a more sustainable system that's like a forest garden or food forest <clears throat> but um over a smaller garden you really need to either import compost and uh or you need to do a lot of work making making the compost mm -hmm. uh in the garden. So, you know, there's a certain amount of space 
required for perennials. And then when you're doing the uh, the annual thing, I think, you know, you, you really want to just have some really, really good compost, which either you pay for it or you uh, work for or you have the space to Set just aside. make compost piles. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, how, how, what are your thoughts on, on some of the uh, like season extension and, and alternative methods of heating that like uh, Will Allen out in uh, Milwaukee has been doing, like setting aside how sustainable all the, the plastic of his aquaponic system is, but, but just, and then also using the vertical space and the, and the, the aquaculture, you know. I, you know, I, I'm kind of a purist, so I haven't really followed. Um, I mean, like Will, I would, as far as I, as far as I know, which I don't really know anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, it's urban agriculture. So when I see urban ag, I kind of, you know, shut down. Like when I see, you know, too much plastic or right. uh, the um, the tunnels. Um. I'm kind of old school, you know, I, w- I would really just want to try to use, like, even if we could do, like, o- organic straw mm-hmm. bales with wood windows with glass yeah, uh, for, you know, maybe some coal frames and then, you know, just like a really nice, I think in the city we just need to bite the bullet and uh, have greenhouse infrastructure i mean we all need to grow food so why you know if we can afford greenhouses for botanical gardens and things like this mm-hmm. you know and they were like in chicago we got garfield park conservatory mm-hmm. yeah we have a big I mean, conservatory that, too. that thing was built you know what a hundred and something years ago yeah yeah 20 30 years ago so I think, you know, that type of infrastructure can be afforded for every uh, neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if, if it's going to make the community more sustainable and you could potentially grow tropical fruit uh, in some of those. I yeah. mean, I'm not sure how well yeah. that would work, but... At least you could do you know, some, we, though, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we need to... You know, we need to be, you know, learning how to do this and getting better at it and find out what doesn't work and what does work. So basically, we're just wasting a lot of time and energy driving around in cars and going through drive throughs when, you know, those cars in Bucky Fuller fashion could be, uh, you know, the steel could be melted down and, you know, turned into these beautiful, uh, you know, antique, vintage, hipster, uh, you know, Victorian greenhouses ah there you go art and art nouveau right yeah. you know um you know then maybe we you know you know we wouldn't have to uh breathe so much uh carbon monoxide you know yeah. coming out the back of uh you know all these uh, <laughs> ignorant people cars yeah. you know every uh, day we, and, we, you know Breathe a lot more fresh oxygen from the source year round, even in a cold climate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put a lot of trees and put a lot of benches. There you go. Them, take the trees, you know, uh, fruit bearing trees, and then put some uh, berry shrubs. Mm-hmm. And now you got the shade, you got the food, and you can share it with your friend. I mean, for me, that's the ultimate communitarian, you know, uh, sustainable and ecologically friendly design and then if you put a little free library you can go and if no one's there you could just read a book and eat your apple and you your go. blackberries or whatever whatever it is yeah i mean it sounds good to me yeah sign me up yeah for that. <laughs> it, i mean anything is better than you know like you know working and toiling in a field <clears throat> yeah in the sun without any shade. And I think that's that's the solution. You know, we can do monoculture, agricultural crops, mm-hmm. you know, and be toiling in the field, in a big field, uh, you know, full sun, or we can sit under an apple tree next to a, a, you know, a black raspberry bush 
and with some dandelions growing at our feet, and, you know, uh, a little free library, and we can actually, you know, uh, live yeah. well without killing anybody uh, or ourselves, you know, and, and, you know, to do so. That yeah. To me, that's culture, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I would yeah. definitely agree with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so for yourself, when you're, when you're out working in, in your garden, how, how does it feel to you? Does it, does it even feel like work or does it, is there more, is it more of a joyous thing, I guess, put it that way? Yeah, for me, it always feels like work, but that's because I'm, you know, I'm always making a garden I was doing like something, that, yeah. being, that's been destroyed. I'm always repairing a garden that, that's been destroyed. I'm moving it. Because the hipsters are trying to, you know, steal it. Oh no! Uh, yeah, or I just don't have like like I haven't had a garden in the past, uh, you know, two years. Yeah. Basically, I've been traveling around. Traveling so around. I think Come that's, around. you know, more the, you know, I think the story of like a lot of people, apartment dwellers, you know, and yeah. I mean, mo- for them mostly they just rent a plot at a community garden but that comes with its own problems i'm a designer um and i'm also you know i mean i'm all i need is the space to produce enough food to feed myself so that's right. one of the basic challenges uh i think for sustainability and that bill talks about a lot uh which is land access so i have to deal with that um you know basically having access to a piece of land to design and develop a food system, um, a perennial food system, which again takes up some space, uh, you know, um, doesn't necessarily require as much water, but still requires some capital to set up. Um, So I've dealt with all of those on on a very extreme kind of level. Um, But you know, there's nothing like it. Number one, even at the level that I'm doing it at, uh, which has all these limitations, um, you know, uh, it's, I wouldn't, I mean, I do it, you know, I still do it. And even when it gets really, really, you know, hard, which is, it kind of is most of the time because people aren't really hip, uh, to the permaculture. I think that I'm, uh, you know, really pushing, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of my time, which I think people can't relate is I'm observing the garden, hmm. just being in it. You know, I mean, one, it, the, my gardens are some of the most natural, um, you know, you know, cultivated spaces that I know of, meaning, you know, like this garden that I'm working on now was left feral for two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, just, um, so I've been doing a lot of work on it. I mean, basically the past month, I've been cleaning it up. So there's been a lot of, uh, you know, plant killing going on, right, with the weeds and stuff. But um, you know, I guess it's, you know, it's a very, it's a more meditative and thoughtful mm. process than what I see, uh, you know, other people doing around me. Like I, you know, I'm spending a lot of time. I make these benches, uh, uh, which you can see on my Instagram or, uh, you probably on my Instagram is the best place where I take these cinder blocks, these two cinder blocks and find a board where the width is about, you know, basically you just look around and you'll find a board at some point that would make a a good bench top. And then put that on top of your cinder block so you got a bench. And so what I do with any site that I'm designing is I try to go in and set up places to sit as soon as possible. Because, Mm -hmm. you you know, in order to to design, you got to observe uh, in order to observe, you don't want to really be doing that standing up. You know, uh, you want to be able to sit down. So uh, creating a, m- multiple places to sit in the garden, and those are usually going to be in the shade spots sure. because you're going to sure. want to sit down and not be in the sun. And having multiple places to sit in different shade spots is important because as the sun moves, you know, 
what was a shade spot will become a full sun spot. So these are some of the first things that I need to do in order to really set up a site so I can work in it, which basically means to be able to stay in that site throughout the day without actually doing anything. So people will be like, you know, they'll be looking at me and I'm sure they're thinking he ain't doing nothing, <laughs> but I, I am not doing nothing. That's the whole point of permaculture is like do nothing gardening uh, or, you know, Fukuoka, you know, uh, you, you know, work with rather than against nature or do nothing farming. Mm -hmm. right? And you get these concepts in your head. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, basically, you know, we need to rewild ourselves. We need to spend more time in nature. Well, what's the biggest design problem? I mean, really is, you know, we need to stay out of the sun and we need to be able to sit comfortably um, so we don't have to get up and walk around uh, too much. And so that's what I've learned. Uh, I enjoy being in the garden. Um, another problem with access uh, is that you know, oftentimes my garden is not right outside my door as you would want it to be right. uh, in a permaculture system. So this is something that we deal with with class and urban. You know, you have to commute to your garden just to have a garden. And that really, um, you know, what can I say? It's just, uh, it's a problem that, you know, burden we all have to carry, but Ultimately, uh, because it's a burden that, you know, we all have to carry, or at least the ones of us who don't have houses um, and land, um, you know, we we don't have to carry it alone because we all carry it. So really, it's just kind of getting people to wake up and realize that, like, you know, if we don't work together and cooperate and do something about this, you know, we're going to, you know, basically nothing's, you know, going to change. But aside from those two things, you know, having to commute um, and generally there's just not being enough seating uh, and enough trees uh, over the, the over the duration mm -hmm. of that commute. You know, that's always uh, been a challenge. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean. Being in the garden, being anytime I'm in the garden and I'm designing is great because I actually uh, am, you know, um, exerting power and authority over the environment in which I inhabit. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I'm also doing that in a in a conscious and ethical way, which means you know minimum invasiveness, you know you know, preferably no damage, building soil, leaving it better. Uh, and a lot of that is really just creating a space where other humans can kind of see, you know, okay, we don't have to be destructive. And, oh, isn't this nice? You know, look at this, you know, uh, look at these trees, look at these plants. You know, I didn't really appreciate uh, nature as much before. Because the attitude is, is like, yeah, I'm just going to grow my crops and get extract my food from the soil and not give anything back. And, you know, I mean, those attitudes and that type of consciousness is, um, you know, I mean, that's the main problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the people's thinking and the way that they're, uh, you know, going back to the quote from Einstein or whatever. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, but I love being in my garden. I, I, I'm, I'm, the more the older I get, and you know, the more I spend time I spend in it, uh, you know, I think uh, it, it's. I envy the people who, you know, have a two thousand square foot garden with you know, with full sun, some some trees, and it's uh, right outside their kitchen door. Oh yeah, man. That would be the life. So you can yeah. just set up your little herb spiral or whatever right outside your back door and then mm -hmm. everything else put back as it's needed and, yeah, do some real real homesteading, even urban homesteading. Yeah. 
Let's One go. thing I got is this stove. I got this backpacker stove, and mm -hmm. then I also got this other one, a uh, solo stove light. And so for me, that's been um, really great. If you get into the habit of going to the garden and, you know, making a little fire with this rocket stove or uh, using this backpacker stove to, you know, bring your water with you, boil it, and just get some herbs from your herb spiral and make some tea. And if you do that three times throughout the day, maybe have a thermos and, you know, boil your water once in the morning mm -hmm. uh, and then just kind of, you know, bring it back to a boil real quick. Um, you know, for me, that's the life. You know, we want to spend as much time in nature and in natural environments as possible. And, you know, mm -hmm. so... You know, I, I I don't know how we're going to do that. Um, you know, I live in a tent, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, um, you know, I enjoy being in houses like I'm in, in a house now. But um, I find that, you know, living in houses come with so many problems. And that's part of where we're, you know. Like, we got so long to go, so much to learn from, you know, natural systems that we really need to very quickly put as much nature around us and around our living, uh, you know, spaces as possible so we can just basically stop turning those car keys. Yeah. Yeah. You so, know. I mean, I mean, to me, that, that sounds like uh, the solution is really more connection, more connection between people more connection to the land that, that we all depend on mm -hmm. um, and just physical connection, not just in a, an emotional or, or a spiritual connection, but like just physically being a part of the, the landscape, the ecology that you are actually a part of. You just don't necessarily think about it or know it. So yeah, that's really if cool. you have, you know, a certain, I mean, let's say a perennial bush, you know, will produce, you know, food for maybe three weeks. Mm hmm. Right. So if we can just think if we got 12 months out the year, even if we just got 12 plants, 12 different species of plants, you know, that's, you know, potentially, you know, enough food to carry us through the year. Through the year. You know, at least we can always be going out to the garden getting some nourishment, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how we make sure that we have a, a, a ongoing relationship with uh our garden by design designing it so that you know there's always food there because if we're just doing annual garden you know we're not going to have any food in the winter time <clears throat> yeah not to, not know? to mention we're going to be you know it's going to be the boom and bust cycle basically of work where either you got it, nothing to do or you have nothing. everything to do right and you got to chop down a whole forest right right you know get ready for winter so you know, so we have to be planting those trees that we're going to burn for wood. And once we do that, you know, we're going to be a lot more conservative. You know, they got the white man fire, you know, which is big, you know, and a lot of smoke. And then, the, you know, what they call, you know, uh, you know, the native man's fire, which is, you know, small and very efficient. It doesn't, you know, use too, too many resources. So, you know, these are uh, real observations and real issues and i mean you know you choose you know the you know the, the way the indigenous uh people created fires because we know it's um you know more sustainable you know mm -hmm. um, and pr protecting the you know um the forest and planting new forests because we know we, we need the forest as a resource obviously i mean we've we've destroyed you know, so yeah, much, so, so much in the, in the name so, of profit in, in the name of not even food. Like, you know, uh, so much corn goes to just ethanol these days and, and, uh, to feed other animals when we could just be using it to cultivate stuff for ourselves <laughs> directly. You know, it's just such a big and wasteful system. And, and yet, uh, capitalism is always, uh, seen as, as being so efficient and, and, and so, <laughs> you know, not wasteful because you're always talking about profit, but it, it does Yeah, that's marketing. That's right. That's marketing. It doesn't, doesn't shake Mark out that way in the end. 
Uh-huh. They pay people to come up with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to get just a few more minutes into the into the chapter before we wrap up for tonight. So let's let's keep on going. Write an agricultural romance, but be satisfied with a crop of forty four bushels per acre. That needs no exceptional soil, but merely a rational culture. And let us see what it means. The 3,600,000 individuals who inhabit the two departments of Sine and Sinewas consume yearly for their food a little less than 22 million bushels of cereals, chiefly wheat. And in our hypothesis, they would have to cultivate, in order to obtain this crop, 494,200 acres out of their 1,507,300 acres which they possess. It is evident that they would not cultivate them with spades, that would need too much time, 96 work days of 5 hours per acre. It would be preferable to improve the soil once for all, to drain what needed draining, to level what needed leveling, to clear the soil of stones were it even necessary to spend 5 million days of 5 hours in this preparatory work, an average of 10 work days to each acre. Then they would plow with the steam digger, which would take 1 and 3 fifths of a day per acre, and they would give another 1 and 3 fifths of a day for working with the double plow. Seeds would be sorted by steam instead of taken haphazard, and they would be carefully sown in rows instead of being thrown to the four winds. Now, all this work would not take ten days of five hours per acre if the work were done under good conditions, but if ten million work days are given to good culture during three to four years, the result will be that later on crops of forty-four to fifty-five bushels per acre will be obtained by only working half the time. 15 million workdays will thus have been spent to give bread to a population of 3,600,000 inhabitants, and the work would be such that everyone could do it without having muscles of steel or without having even worked the ground before. The initiative and the general distribution of work would come from those who know the soil. As for the work itself, there is no townsman of either sex so enfeebled as to be incapable of looking after machines and of contributing his share to agrarian work after a few hours' apprenticeship. Well, when we consider that in the present chaos there are in a city like Paris, without counting the unemployed of the upper class, there are always about 100,000 workmen out of work in their several trades, we see that the power lost in our present organization would alone suffice to give, with a rational culture, all the bread that is necessary for the three or four million inhabitants of the two departments. We repeat that this is no fancy dream, and we have not yet spoken of the truly intensive agriculture. We have not depended upon the wheat obtained in three years by Mr. Hallett, of which one grain replanted produced 5,000 or 6,000 and occasionally 10,000 grains, which would give us the wheat necessary for a family of five individuals on an area of 120 square yards. On the contrary, we have only mentioned that this is being already achieved by numerous farmers in France, England, Belgium, etc., and what might be done tomorrow with the experience and knowledge acquired already by practice on a large scale. But without a revolution, neither tomorrow nor after tomorrow will see it done, because it is not to the interest of landowners and capitalists, and because peasants, who would find their profit in it, have neither the knowledge, nor the money, nor the time to obtain what is necessary to go ahead. The society of today has not yet reached this stage, but let Parisians proclaim an anarchist commune, and they will of necessity come to it, because they will not be foolish enough to continue making luxurious toys which Vienna, Warsaw, and Berlin make as well already, and to run the risk of being left without bread. Moreover, agricultural work, by the help of machinery, would soon become the most attractive and the most joyful of all occupations. We have had enough jewelry and enough dolls' clothes, they would say. It is high time for the workers to recruit their strength in agriculture, to go in search of vigor, of impressions of nature, of the joy of life that they have forgotten in the dark factories of the suburbs. In the Middle Ages, it was alpine pasture lands rather than guns which allowed the Swiss to shake off lords and kings. Modern agriculture will allow a city in revolt to free itself from the combined bourgeois forces. Part 3 We have seen how the three and one-half million inhabitants of the two departments round Paris could find ample bread by cultivating only a third of their territory. Let us now pass on to cattle. Englishmen, who eat much meat, consume on average a little less than 220 pounds a year per adult. Supposing all meat consumed were oxen, that makes a little less than a third of an ox. An ox a year for five individuals, including children, is already a sufficient ration. 
For three and one half million inhabitants, this would make an annual consumption of 700,000 head of cattle. Today, with the pasture system, we need at least 5 million acres to nourish 660,000 head of cattle. This makes 9 acres per each head of horned cattle. Nevertheless, with prairies moderately watered by spring water, as recently done on thousands of acres in the southwest of France, 1 and 1 fourth million acres already suffice. But if intensive culture is practiced and beetroot is grown for fodder, you only need a quarter of that area, that is to say about 310,000 acres. And if we have recourse to maize and practice ensilage, the compression of fodder while green, like Arabs, we obtain fodder on an area of 217,500 acres. In the environs of Milan, where sewer water is used to irrigate the fields, fodder for two to three horned cattle per each acre is obtained on the area of 22,000 acres, and on a few favored fields up to 177 tons of hay to the 10 acres have been cropped, the yearly provender of 36 milk cows. Nearly nine acres per head of cattle are needed under the pasture system, and only two and one half acres for nine oxen or cows under the new system. These are the opposite extremes in modern agriculture. In Guernsey, on a total of 9,884 acres utilized, nearly half, 4,695 acres, are covered with cereals and kitchen gardens. Only 5,189 acres remain as meadows. On these 5,189 acres, 1,480 horses, 7,260 head of cattle, 900 sheep, and 4,200 pigs are fed which makes more than three head of cattle per two acres without reckoning the sheep or the pigs. It is needless to add that the fertility of the soil is made by seaweed and chemical manures. Returning to our three and one half million inhabitants belonging to Paris and its environs, we see that the land necessary for the rearing of cattle comes down from five million acres to 197,000. Well then, let us not stop at the lowest figures. Let us take those of ordinary intensive culture. Let us liberally add to the land necessary for smaller cattle, which must replace some of the horned beasts, and allow 395,000 acres for the rearing of cattle, 494,000 if you like, on the 1,013,000 acres remaining after the bread has been provided for the people. Let us be generous and give 5 million workdays to put this land into a productive state. After having, therefore, employed in the course of a year 20 million workdays, half of which are for permanent improvements, we shall have bread and meat assured to us, without including all the extra meat obtainable in the shape of fowls, pigs, rabbits, etc., without taking into consideration that a population provided with excellent vegetables and fruit consumes less meat than Englishmen, who supplement their poor supply of vegetables by animal food. Now, how much do 20 million workdays of five hours make per inhabitant? Very little indeed. A population of three and one half millions must have at least one million two hundred thousand adult men, and as many women capable of work. All right, I think that's a another good place to to stop. Um, so it, that was a lot of numbers. Um, it's basically the same sort of thing that that we were trying to do just recently and, and calculate how much people, how much labor was needed to produce for uh, a given population of of uh, local people. Um, but what I found interesting about all that is, is he's basically offering the same, uh, promises, if you will. So he's saying that, that if we do things the way that he's proposing, work will be more joyful. Uh, people will be able to do it no matter their, their, uh, you know, strength, pretty much, pretty much everyone will be able to do it, uh, whether them you know, men, women, um, or, or, or neither. Uh, and we can do it on, on less acreage than we do it now. And we can produce enough to, you know, last the whole year. Um, so, so less work, um, easier work, more, more rewarding and joyful work. And though, though he is, is trying to say that that promise would be fulfilled through machinery, permaculture we make those same sorts of promises but it's just that we fulfill we say that they can be fulfilled through well basically people and and design and just doing things differently turning things on their head from the beginning turning agriculture on its head from the beginning right well okay so you know peter kropotkin when did he write conquest of bread 
It was like 1890s. Okay, so there's number one. We got Bill Mollison, 1990, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, pretty much, 1988. Yeah, right? pretty close, you know, yeah. Pretty close to 100 years later. Year. So, so you, know, you know, Peter Kropotkin is the Bill Mollison, you know, <laughs> of, you know, right, of the right. 19th century, right? Okay, so... Um, so perhaps, you know, uh, you know, and I think it's probably just because I haven't, you know, really, I'm still dealing with, you know, after uh, Farmers of 40th Century, but, you know, I think, yeah, it would be obvious to put this book on that, uh, um, you know, bibliography leading up to the designer's manual. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, that's, you know, like a lot of numbers, and that's what we were trying to do or are doing. That's what permaculturalists and permaculture designers uh, uh, are supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you look at this as being, uh, you know, 130 years ago, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's what he was doing. Yeah, he was just doing it from uh, you know the uh, you know at that time the perspective you know the time. agriculture wasn't the agriculture that we're dealing with right. number one they were still using hand tools and you know um, you know plows, horse, yeah. horse power to implements yeah. right I mean a lot of people were mm-hmm. you know? um, so we got a uh, but he was doing an energy audit, and I think that's, you know, I mean, I think that's, you know, the best thing. It's like basically these older books and, all, um, you know, these these thinkers, uh, you know, these visionaries, you know, everybody was, you know, thinking and analyzing. And, you know, I mean, even uh, a farm monoculture is a design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you could still call it a design, sure. It's not a very good one. (laughs) It's not very energy efficient. It's It's not not, very nuanced, uh, no. It's not ecological. (laughs) You know, it's not sustainable. But, you know, there's a pattern there. And, um, you know, and when we do the energy audit, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we got to look at the numbers and see, hey, how how much money, how much time are we saving? What's our quality of life? You know, uh, what's our nutrition, you know, like, you know, how's our food? I mean, that's the bottom line. What three times a day are you eating? And do you like what you're eating? Right. You know, so, uh, so yeah, man, I think, um, I mean, there was a lot of things that I was thinking as I was listening, um, Mm -hmm. you know, to that, uh, last part. I like the revolution, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's always, you know, cool when they uh, mention that because we got to look at Fukuoka, One Straw Revolution. Right. Uh, and then, Bill, I like to, you know, we said something about, like, you know, we got these conservationists, but they don't have gardens. <laughs> you know, so, like, that's the least change for the greatest effect. You can, the least thing you can do to make the world a better place is to right. grow uh you know, some food. Then, like, I think, with, yeah, like you were saying, you know, um, from each according to their need or or, or, or according yeah. to their ability. Ability to each according to their need, need, yeah. need, So these are, like, ethical um, yeah. considerations. And then participation. Uh, oh, another thing I was, I was thinking of was, like, you know, um, and this was kind of throughout the whole uh, segments of the book. Uh, that were being read was like uh, that. Well, it was with this, uh, a section talking about unemployment and people being unemployed. So, yeah. like, there's a, a segment in the designers' manual where, where Bill says, you know, you know, there's nothing worse for for a member of a community than to be regarded as unemployable. Yeah. Okay. That means, in in a way, I would say it is like you know basically going back to that imagination and creativity connection, Mm -hmm. like the community, you know, as a whole lacks the, um, a creative, you know, vision and imagination to find a use for a person. Yeah. 
you know, and that's like really bad. It's a bad sign. Of, you know, this community's not healthy. This community's not working together. They don't value each other. Uh, you know, that's the way that I kind of look at it, you know, oh, yeah. and, be, and the reason why I say communities, because like, look, you know, we have to think on the community level. Absolutely. You know, permaculture is about eco village development. Mm hmm. You know, we know these big cities and these big societies and, and whatnot, you know, are not sustainable and they're not going to work. We are we going to as a community going to depend on the city mm -hmm. for our survival? Yeah, I mean, it can't be 100 percent for sure. It's just too much. Yeah, I mean, we don't want it to be, you know, um, more than 20 percent. Right. Mm -hmm. Because. Mm -hmm. Culture is self-reliance and, you know, uh, inter communal interdependence. That's a bill quote that I like. Uh, so, you know, we can't afford to have people in our community who are unemployable, you know, and I think that's you know, with the lack of diversity, once we get all, you know, mach machine oriented and, uh, you know, we're getting rid of opportunities for people to actually cooperate, contribute. Um, and participate. So we got to be real careful about what things that we automate and we use machines for mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, then we're, we're going to have people in our community who basically uh, can't do anything. And, yeah. you know, they're going to be, they're still going to be dependent on the community for uh, food and, you know, shelter and clothing and, you know, these resources. Right. You know, yeah, no, I, I, I can definitely see what you're saying. Um, and I, I think that that extra promise that, that permaculture makes is is in that uh, it can help, you know, give a whole lot more people uh, a sense of, of, of purpose um, and an ability to contribute to that community interdependence in, in a real and meaningful way. Um, right. In, in, and, and that's not something that automation and, and machinery can do at all. In fact, it does the opposite. So um, I think very much so adding this permaculture component into into these theories of, of anarchism bolsters anarchism. It, it makes it work more as it should, you know, on the on the small scale uh, with with lower hierarchies. And in fact, because we're not relying on, on machinery as much and and these uh, fuel intensive ways of, of cultivating things. Right. Um, we're lowering that barrier to entry. So we're making it a lot more available to people that are, are, are lower down economically as well. I think, I think if you, you would be wise to take, you know, Kropotkin and then take, uh, you know, Bucky, mm -hmm. Bucky and then take Bill yeah. and to make a connection between, the three of them, because I mean, really, that was the connection I was going to make when they're talking about revolution. Well, you know, yeah. who who really talking about revolution, you know, in permaculture? I mean, Bill was talking about it quite, you know, a bit, but I would, you know, I would still give him second place compared to Bucky because that was Bucky's whole thing. Yeah, and you're talking about Buckminster Fuller, Fuller for the Buck, people that yeah, might Buck, not be uh, familiar. They don't know, then I can't help them. You know, but. <laughs> There's a lot of information out there about him. I, I yeah. haven't really dug into his work all that much myself, but brilliant yeah. guy for sure. Well, Bucky is the, he's, you know, if, if Bill is the father of permaculture, then Bucky's the, the grandfather. Oh, okay. Of, of permaculture in the sense of like, yeah, design. So, you know, and then it's like, you know, if we look at permaculture go, kind of dealing with appropriate technology in mm -hmm. the design science revolution, you know, that's when we're turning the tanks and guns and the, and the spades. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Spades and wheelbarrows. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, now we're planting trees and... You know, we're all working together to plant, replant forest. Oh, yeah. So, and so on. So that would be the design, like the design science revolution with Bucky was that, you know, we'll design, we'll turn it, we'll design, we'll make ultralight alloys mm -hmm. that are stronger than steel and lighter than steel, mm -hmm. 
and make airplanes that are super efficient and, uh, you know, basically don't use no fuel. Right. Uh, and once we get there, you know, everybody can fly anywhere. And so that's the design science revolution. But I think the permaculture design science revolution is like, okay, there's these tools that have been around for, you know, thousands of years and that have a thousand years of development, design, incremental design that takes o- over a long period of time to happen with water wheels. You've got to get a Pelton wheel. So, you know, if we get a bunch of Pelton wheels and invest in water, earthworks where we can harness the water, the energy from, you know, our slope in our water storage, okay, you know, that would be, you know, kind of like I would say permaculture design science revolution. But if we're just dealing with just appropriate technology Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, we can just start with the spades um, and plant in water and water cans and and start. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I'm kind of like on both. I like Bucky, you know, I like technology you know, I'm, you know, a primitive skills person, you know, but, uh, you know, I use uh, WW uh, MFG, you know, diamond point spade. It costs mm-hmm. 90 bucks. It's made out of steel. Uh-huh. And, you know, I won't work without that, you know, because the, the hippie, yeah. I go at some hippie spot and they want me to work with you know, tools from like 90 years ago that, you know, haven't been taken care of and are rusty. And it's just like, you know, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I I can't, I I, I won't work with those. And then all you can do is walk away because, you know, yeah, Yeah. you know, the technology of of spades and hand tools is at 2021 too. It's not just the computers that have, right. Evolve. You can choose to go and buy a cheap tool mm-hmm. that will hurt you and that will hurt your plants, and that's going to be the interface you have. I mean, we really need to look at human beings as you know the machines, and what you the what the hand tool you choose is going to decide how you interact with Nate in your garden. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Um, got a, cu- a couple of questions coming in from the chat here. So, uh, Gudetama Rose, I hope I pronounced that correctly, says, uh, so does this only work on a small, in small communities? I, I, I believe referring to permaculture. And then also asks, is this all related to the work of Derek Jensen? Okay. So, no. Uh, I don't think, I mean, uh, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, uh, and there's a bunch of other people, uh, you know, who are, um, you know, responsible for permaculture design. Uh, Derek, you know, is, is not really one of them, but he's a, he's an activist, uh, and he's a, he's a writer and, you know, he, he's definitely worth, um, you know, I think if we're talking about permaculture, you know, uh, I haven't seen, you know, any of his gardens or, you know, uh, any trees that he's planted. But, you know, I mean, you know, we, everybody doesn't have to uh, do that. And, um, you know, we need people to uh, basically produce what they're, um, you know, what, you know, whatever, what does it say from each according to you know, to what they can contribute. And, you know, Derek's, I I love Derek's stuff. I mean, you know, Derek, it was actually, when I first started researching permaculture, one of the videos I came across was Derek Jensen's, um, what is that? What's the video? Um, you know, the one I'm talking about. Um, you know, I, I am vaguely familiar with his work. I know I've heard him interviewed before, but, but I can't, I don't know exactly which one. Man, I'm trying to remember uh, the one. Um, it's it's old. It's the old one. It's one of the oldest ones. Um, but okay, so I will just say, you know, when I was uh, first 
learning about permaculture, well, you know, one of Derek's videos is one of the videos that I came across, and it wasn't really talking about permaculture, mm. um, you know, but it, you know, it was also because really when we're talking about permaculture, we're talking about, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and uh, so, yeah, but Bill Mollison, David Holmgren, um, you know, these are the of uh, permaculture, then, uh, you know, Bucky Fuller, and then all these other people. I mean, really kind of started in some ways uh, with, you know, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson, but then we also got a bunch of old school people. I mean, uh, J. Russell Smith, um, Tree Crops, yeah, a per, uh, P. P.A. Yeoman. Uh, P.A. Yeoman. Yeah, exactly. Very Charged. influential on, on permaculture. Key line design. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, one of the, you know, one of the other, uh, you know, really, you know, if we're going to, you know, give people, you know, father title. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Yeoman's is definitely, um, you know, I mean, he's right after Bucky, right? Yeah. You know? He's right after Bucky, and he's up there, you know, he's up there at the top in many ways, you know. Cool. So, and what was the other question? Uh, the other question was, um, is this only workable on, in small communities? Oh, How's, yeah. How scalable, I guess, is, is the question. Yeah, well, I think it's, okay, it's infinitely scalable, you know, if we understand that there's a limit to uh, scale, mm -hmm. right? You know, you want to permaculture the whole earth. Well, the way that you do it is with a, with you know, millions of millions of people, yeah. Very small systems, and then you know, uh, less of larger systems, and less of larger systems, and less of larger systems, and then, you know, you know, you, you know are you going to do 640 acres? You can do 640 acres permaculture, but you know, you're going to need. Um, a, lot a lot of, of people yeah. in that system. You're gonna need a lot of help. So that means you need each. You're gonna make you know, you know, how many people are gonna help you with it, and you're gonna need a system for each one of those people, mm -hmm. and then you're gonna need you know uh, community systems, and then you know a, 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 a large portion of that needs to be uh, zone five wilderness. So that's a whole nother thing. So zone five is not small scale. You know, right. so the reforestation, the rewilding, um, you know, and just the social community and political work that needs to be done. So if we got 640 acres, you know, we want to turn, you know, uh, I mean, 400 of that into into zone five forest, if possible. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a big job. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go that's ahead. a big job. And, and, and yeah, but but. If we're talking about uh, more productive systems, then then potentially we can we can carve out that space and, and let a lot of that go back to wilderness, you know, because we right. don't need as much for ourselves. Using energy efficient, you mm -hmm. know, stoves well, and, that too, yeah. and energy efficient houses, right? Well insulated, you know, passive solar, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't, you, you know, you only have to burn wood a couple of days out of the year right yeah, when it's sure. like you know, negative 10 below all we have to turn on the rocket stove yep yeah a avoiding those uh type one errors in in building design not just in in planning out our, our gardens our gardens at home integrating home and garden and you know energy efficient home design and mm -hmm. i mean the one thing, like the science that I've uh, looked up, you know, basically gardens produce about 1.5 pounds per square foot. And then uh, farms are usually around one pound. Mm -hmm. So just that, I mean, right there, you know, is telling that gardens are 33 percent more efficient. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's just gardening. That ain't permaculture. Yeah. That, that's nothing fancy yet. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, you know, these are the numbers that, we'll, you know, just like we, we, you know, we need a, a, a couple of, you know, 
you know, hippies, you know, communists, you know, hipsters and like, you know, some anarchists, you know, and some agrarians, yeah. you know, and all just, you know, form a couple of small, you know, work groups, you know, task force and just, you know, basically research uh, and get all this information together. And, um, you know, I mean, apply uh, some research models and demonstrations so we can really, you know, just go find a vegan. There has to be some vegan somewhere who want to eat raw. Mm hmm. And, you know, make a garden and say, look, you know, we're going to feed you until, you know, you say stop. <laughs> and, you know, and, and and if it's too much, if we're giving you too much food, then we're going to take one one bed out of the garden. Right. Instead of 20 beds, we'll have 19. And then, you know, we'll keep removing beds until, you know, it's, you know, he's like, no, no, I need more food. <laughs> Bigger salad, please, right? You know, <laughs> and we'll salad. figure out how many plants are in those boxes. That's the scientific approach to doing this. And we'll have a definitive case study of, okay, yeah. this vegan yeah. requires this many plants. This is what he wanted. You know, he wanted 10 Swiss chard. And, you know, this is what he ate. Mm -hmm. He keeps changing the, you know, the design, tweaking it. And that's that incremental design. We'll only get those results over 20 years mm -hmm. but you know, in the city how many abandoned lots you got you uh, know how many unused balconies like that that's one thing that i've been noticing a lot is they've been putting up a whole lot of high rises or even mid-rise buildings pr basically all the new construction in in like uh the minneapolis st paul area every mm -hmm. unit has its own balcony mm -hmm. and it's almost always completely just barren that you might have a chair or two but that that's that's about it that's such such potential and you're stacking them on top of each other one after another that's a lot of extra acreage we can pull out of basically the sky <laughs> right yeah and i think that's where yeah i mean it might take you know um some you know capitalist hipsters or some hipster thinking folk you know with some capital to or some permaculture designers to develop you know a development Mm -hmm. Um, not that it would be permaculture to d develop a, you know, a skyscraper, mm -hmm. but, you know, if you're going to, you know, it would probably be good if we could develop like the most sustainable, you know, low cost, uh, you know, not too tall skyscraper, Yeah. you know, where you could grow some food, you know, on a balcony yeah. because it is cheaper to go up right but you know those things have their shadows and uh yeah sure. man you know balconies it's balcony growing has to be better than growing indoors i know that much yeah 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 that, that's yeah. all i have right now i know i don't have my camera on for you right now but yeah, yeah. my entire living room is filled with plants basically but that's that's the that's space i got was. so <laughs> that's how it was i had a palm trees man i had so much stuff <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I have I, a... what I grew the most of because I didn't have any light. So yeah. I was using grow lights, but you know, I wasn't really getting uh I wasn't didn't have any food growing. So that was the that made it even harder because, you know, most of the stuff most of the stuff I'm growing, none of the, none of it I can eat. Oh, yeah. So but, yeah. but clean air and uh you know, all the aloe you could ask for. There you go. Yeah, I got a aloe that's gone crazy in my, my living room here. Yeah, uh, um, I have a, a passion fruit rind that uh, is now my largest plant that, that I just grew uh, from seeds that I got from a, a, a fruit from the store. And uh, it's, it's now grown from basically 10 inches off the ground in its pot up until it's like bumping against the ceiling now. So nice that's been fun to grow we have a really nice we're really lucky to have a, a nice south facing window without any obstructions so yeah okay. i've seen the, the plants in some of your videos man it looks yeah. awesome oh thank you i appreciate that yeah. yeah and maybe someday my my banana tree has gotten we just looked at pictures from just a, a few years ago and it's gotten like three times its size from even a few years ago so maybe someday i'll get a, a yield out of that one but <laughs> you never know <laughs> yeah all right well yeah I,
I, I think this is probably a, a good place to leave it for tonight in terms of uh, the the book itself. We're just about halfway through this this final chapter, so it'll make a good two part series. Um, so, is there anything else before we go into uh, doing your promotion stuff? Is there anything else you wanted to, to mention before we go into that? Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you for um, you know for doing uh, what you've been doing. Um, You're you know, for me, it's you know, it's really nice to see because, you know, you know, there's this this long kind of like, you know, history of ideas and development. Um, and, you know, I, you know, every now and then you see the, you know, somebody makes the reference to Peter Kropotkin, mm-hmm. um, you know, but then it's that's kind of that, you know, so yeah, kinda, I think it's been a real gift to the permaculture community and the anarchist community, um, the work that you're doing, because, you know, the connection is, is made, it's discussed, um, and, you know, it's represented. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's, I, it's I think there's, there's a lot that, that both communities have to offer each other, you know, on, on the anarchist side, it's, it's getting rid of all these middlemen and, and, you know, rent seekers and people trying to, to take away your money and, and, uh, for providing you not really anything and, and helping people uh, get more free and, and more uh, able to live their highest and best selves. And on the permaculture side, it's it's planning, you know, planning for the future and and um, helping give more people uh, more freedom as well to, to grow their own food and, and control their own destinies. I, I don't even remember who said it, but there's this quote I like that's basically like he who controls his own food controls his destiny. I think, that's, yeah. I think it's very true. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, yeah. that's definitely at, at the core of, of permaculture. So, and also it, it being really accessible from, from a, from a bottom up perspective rather than a top down. I think it just, it's got a lot to offer to, to anarchy and, and other leftist theories. Well, you know, in the prime directive on page one of the designer's manual by Bill Mollison is, you know, uh, make only personally responsible Mm -hmm. decision for ourselves and that of our children and so i mean you know and it says make it now do it now it's It's very action oriented so you know i mean when i read that you know the only thing you know i could connect that to was anarchism yeah and so i was like okay you know i mean it never says that explicitly anywhere but you know, where does he say refuse authority? You know, you know, somewhere he says something like refuse all authority and, uh, you know, cease to invest in our annihilation. Yeah, yeah. man, isn't, right? that, That's isn't that the you. motto of the age? Yeah, yeah, okay, cease to invest uh, in our own uh, annihilation. Okay, so. So for me, you know, like, okay, I mean, you know, we're talking about prolific uh, uh, thinkers and visionaries, you know, when we're talking about Peter and we're talking about Bucky and we're talking about Bill, um, you know, and, you know, David. So, you know, it's important to to read, you know, uh, these guys stuff to study it and, you know, to cross reference it because like yeah i mean here and just playing these videos you know anybody who has studied permaculture can listen to this and say okay yeah this is i mean this is permaculture even though even though we're talking about you know intensive like intensive agriculture well what is intensive agriculture you know i mean you know it needs to be uh it is either work intensive or it's um you know intensive planting Mm -hmm. with diversity I think, yeah. you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, this is what, you know, why people have book groups and why they all read the same book and then they discuss it. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just saying, man, it's, it's a great service, uh, that what you're doing, uh, you know, reviewing this stuff and, you know, allowing space to discuss it and, um, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and anything I can do to help you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to have you on uh, next week at the same time so we can go through part two if you're going to be available okay. for that. Um, yeah, sure. So, yeah, we'll do same sort of thing, seven to, seven to nine uh, Central Standard Time. Um, so, yeah, so so speaking of, of service, let's get into to all the different things that, that you do. And we'll start with, I think we'll start with uh, just the Permaculture page on Facebook. So... Oh, I got all my stuff open. So yeah, so what you're looking at now is the uh, permaculture page on Facebook. Let's see if it's coming up and centered right here. Uh, yep. So as you can see, it's a, it's just under thirty thousand members. Oh, let me take some of those. We'll take some of the stuff off the screen for the moment, so you can see the page better. There you go. Um, so yeah, you've been running that for almost twenty years now, or, or has it been? Or I'm sorry, ten years. almost ten years. Excuse me. Yeah. So this is this ten is the ten year, year anniversary, yeah, isn't it? Ten, ten, tenth anniversary now. Yeah. So happy anniversary to you. That's yeah. a, that's a yeah. That's quite it's a feat. Been, it's been. It, it could have been a rough year this year, but I think we we made we did a good job making sure that um, you know this this year was going to be a little bit more comfortable. Uh, convenient, you know, efficient and enjoyable. Um, and even though it's, you know, it's still been, uh, um, you know, challenging, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, this group, um, you know, you said it's the biggest group. It's, uh, unfortunately it's, it's not the, or, or fortunately actually rather, I should say it's not the biggest permaculture group. How is it not uh, anymore? anymore well one oh. we got rid of uh 25 percent yeah we of, did. you know the group a lot of people uh yeah we got rid of a lot of people okay so we set limits to population and consumption well we're going to set limits to the number of people that can be in the group and that was based on um how much work it was mm -hmm. right you know we're yeah. talking about low maintenance administrating and group uh you know you know management well you know uh you know the people maintaining the system i mean the group needs to sustain the people that uh maintain it uh sure. that's the system so we've been in the game for 10 years uh we got a bunch of groups but this is our biggest group um it would have like 40,000 people in it yeah. if we didn't do uh, a you know clean house and whatnot and you know there have been there's a, a couple other groups there's one permaculture group that's been around for a long time that's i think in french hmm. and it had a hundred and oh really something. i'm not even yeah. aware of that group wow 150 or 80 or 40 or twenty thousand. i remember it used to be like 115 so that thing is huge um i don't i don't know if they're as active it, um as our group and then there's you know, I mean, there's probably at least like like two or three other groups that are probably um, bigger, but ours is the best. Oh, Always for sure. Had, I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Zach is one of the reasons why it's the best is because oh, you because know, one, if you know, if you want to get in the group, you know, he's yep. the guy that you're going to have to you got to get past him. <laughs> <first>. <laughs> Yeah. So answer your questions. If you have any chance of getting in, answer the questions and don't just do like one word things like show that you want to be a part of this group and contribute to it. Yeah. And so basically, you know, we have a great team. Um, you know, we treat it as a, a it's a it's a community. It's for sharing information. Um, you know, uh, it's evolved a lot um, over time. You know, mm -hmm. we've had. Uh, a lot of people come and a lot of people go. Still more people, you know, have shown up than um, have left. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, our one of my personal goals is to, you know, basically get people who uh, want to contribute to the group and appreciate the group, value the group, value the people who manage it. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, this is about permaculture. This is about getting trees planted about getting gardens put in, about creating, developing eco villages and whatnot. So, you know, we could very easily, like I think like a lot of people just create a Facebook group and then you just end up kind of working for Facebook. Yeah. 
<laughs> it doesn't matter if we get any trees planted or any garden, more gardens put in on the planet or any eco villages develop. But, you know, that was one of the things with the 10th year anniversary was like, OK, look, you know, we've been here 10 years. You know, we're not going to do this for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, the, we've done it for the last 10 years. And that was, you know, that's why we're part of the group. Yeah. We're cleaning house, and um, but what we share, we, we got a lot of information, uh, a lot of, you know, basically we're uh, a hub, a repository, uh, an archive for information, and we're trying to keep cycling uh, as much of this inf permaculture information to keep it. Basically, when I started this group, there was only a couple of groups on Facebook about permaculture. There was a big one that was 10,000 people and it was dead. Yeah. No activity at all. So I was like, okay, well, and it was called permaculture. I said, well, okay, you know, I could contact this guy. He was the only person that was, you know, an admin. And I could say, I can like say, well, I, you want to help revive you know, maybe we could work together to revive this. And I was just like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go create another one. Um, and, you know, I named it, uh, you know, the address, the URL was permaculture global. Um, be just because, you know, I mean, Jeff had permacultureglobal.com. So I was like, well, you know, uh, we need a face, you know, we, you know, what's the best address, right? I couldn't get permaculture, so I got permaculture global. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was one thing I did with all my, all my Facebook groups was I made sure to set up an address. Uh, so, you know, so basically it becomes like a website. So that was one thing that I think, you know, the goal was to create a lot of spaces where permaculture information can be shared can be stored um, because, you know, my feeling is that, hey, you know, uh, we, this information needs to get out. If it doesn't get out, what difference does it make? You know, mm -hmm. what's the point? So um, this kind of became uh, the biggest group, uh, permaculture. Um, and we, then we got uh, permaculture Spain which is about 15,000. And then we got, uh, we got permaculture library, which is also about 15,000. And we got a bunch of other groups, which are like, you know, over 5,000 uh, people. We got about 300 groups or something like that. Oh yeah. I've not really counted. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Uh, no matter where you're from, um, if you're listening to this or watching this, uh, just search it. Search for it in Facebook. There's probably a local group and a, and a regional group and a national group. And, and it's, you know, chances are pretty good that, that Matthew has created a, at least one of them. Um, you can go to permacultureguide.org. Permacultureguide.org. I think that's the next one I was going to pull up. Yep. Permacultureguide.org. Beautiful website. Oh, way, yep. This way. is one of my students, uh, Nathan Shannon, um, and then also uh, uh, Peter Geiner. Uh, another one of my students, same class, um, and they've all contributed to uh, this design work and, uh, you know, web development. So if you go to, if you go down, mm -hmm. uh, this is like the portal, but if, if you go down to the bottom, you're going to see uh, global groups. Yeah, there we go. Global groups. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So that's Permaculture Global. That's the website we just... We're at, this is Permaculture Gaia. This is an, another uh, group that is, um, that's a small one. Then we got the focus groups. These are all like groups that deal with, uh, you know, topics like, uh, you know, keeping bees, indoor gardening, earthwork, design, edible flowers. Um, so that's, you know, basically classrooms, and then we got regional groups. Yeah, that's uh, amazing. These are, yeah, so it took me about two years, two and some change to create all of these. Um, and it really was because I knew, you know, we needed to have a way to organize this information. And, um, you know, we just, you know, we needed to be able to, you know, Facebook was the 
you know, everybody was already on it. So right. I said, this is the place to create the model, the, the um, what do they call it? Like the, uh, the prototype. Mm -hmm. So I, this global network where, you know, all the permaculture, people who are interested in permaculture, and should learn about permaculture, could basically, uh, you know, connect and we can uh, pool our resources, co-invest and whatnot. Uh, you know, and 10 years later, you know, I don't really like, being in a relationship with Facebook at all. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of knew that when I started creating it, that like this wasn't really the place for it. But I said, you know, everybody's already on Facebook. So, you know, there's an opportunity here. Now uh, in the 10th anniversary, we're really divesting uh, from Facebook as much as possible. So we have, um, you know, if you go down, there's a website called Global Permaculture Network. Um, and that's the, the new, uh, that's Eco Village. Go back. Oh, did I pick the wrong one? Oops. And, and so we're really, you know, I mean, oh, one, of my, sorry, I the wrong. one of my critiques of permaculture community was that, you know, why are we all on Facebook? We should be on uh have our own social networks, right? That we control. Like what does Bill say? He says, you know, you have to own the land. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise, you know, as anybody who knows on Facebook, when they get blocked, you know, for 30 days, go to Facebook jail, <laughs> you know, well, that's because you don't own the land. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Global Permaculture Network is, you know, hey, it's basically the 2.0 of Permaculture Guide Network, which is all those Facebook groups. So we're, we have open source social network. Uh, um, we have a PHPBB forum, which is all open source stuff. We have a discourse forum. Uh, we also have a Discord um, server. And so these are the... Um, Alternative platforms, right? It's like alternative medicine compared to Big Pharma, right? You know, Big Pharma is Facebook, you know, OSSN and uh, Discourse and whatnot. These other uh, forums, PHPBB, are, um, you know, alternative social networks. And basically, we're migrating, uh, you know, we're, we started charging uh, for the group because, you know, after 10 years of creating all of this, you know, based in order for us to keep doing it, even for us to get to manage it in terms of getting rid of people who aren't really uh, there for any, uh, you know, they're not participating in the group, they're not using the group, uh, getting those people out takes a lot of time. So just for that alone, we had to... Uh, charge from that you know from the experience of working with all these groups i mean you know you can kind of figure out you know how many people do you want to be in a group in order to make it you know manageable now facebook doesn't make it easy to manage but uh in the designer's manual by bill you know he talks about sustainable communities being in the realm of like you know i think like a hundred to like you know two thousand or a thousand, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and this goes back to set of limits to population and consumption. And, uh, you know, how many people do you really want to have in an in a eco village or a community? How many people is sustainable? You know, Dunbar's number, all of that. So, you know, here with these social media and these groups, we have an opportunity to kind of create virtual communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get to cycle through the process of saying, okay, well, you know, who do we want to be here and who don't we want to be here um, in preparation for hopefully actually creating real eco villages um, and having some experience on how to, you know, c put people together, you know, pair people or match people in communities where they can not be, um, you know, fall into the situation of being unemployable. Yeah. 
you know, they can contribute, they can participate. And I, I don't know, I've seen this one article about um, Elon Musk and, you know, how he, he has this, you know, they got the, the all the hipsters uh, from the startups, ha- you know, followed some guy who wrote a book who said, you know, the trick is, is to keep the, keep the assholes out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Yeah. That's good yeah. advice for any organizing. <laughs> that's good advice for any organization. In the beginning, that's really, and that's kind of been, I think, you know, the first 10 years was figuring out who the assholes were, not, you know, who just in the permaculture community. Uh, and there's a lot of them. And, um, you know, then, you know, as far as the development of uh, Permaculture Guy Network, you know, finding out who was really committed to using social media to promote, uh, you know, what I'll call real permaculture or, you know, just, I mean, permaculture as laid down by these people. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. Bill Mollison um, and Buckminster Fuller and Peter Kropotkin. I mean, we're not even, you know, you're not going to go to another permaculture group and probably see a whole lot of Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hopefully in, in my permaculture group, the same thing goes with Bill, mm-hmm. you know, is that you'll see it fairly often and mm-hmm. on a good week, you'll see it every day. Yeah, I, I would say that's that's definitely true. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been a lot of very similarly minded people uh, to myself. Yep. Bill there. So, all right. Yeah. A whole host of websites that you can go check out. See yeah. All the, Perm- all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is a website that I had wanted to create for a long time. Nathan developed that. Which one? That is space. Oh, the Wikipedia. Per- oh yeah. Wikipedia. That one. That's uh, you know just a bunch of Wikipedia links uh, relevant to permaculture. That's uh, great. Yeah. So you go there. You, you know now you got a portal. I'm really into portal development. So mm-hmm. you know you can go, and you know there's just uh, you know you can peruse. Wikipedia, you know, and learn about permaculture. So you can just click on that. Uh, which one? Sorry. Any of them. Oh, sure. Yeah, let's do built environment. Let's talk about that. Okay. So now you got all these links to the web pages uh, on Wikipedia, like tiny houses or sustainable architecture, uh-huh. self molds, um, geodesic domes. That's Let's a bucky. That There's a bucky fuller thing. Yeah. Okay. So this is all about information access and through design. So, so through the design of this website, you know, otherwise you'd have to go and type in geodesic dome, you know, so it's a portal. It, it, it allows you to go That's to cool. many places, on Wikipedia without having to type anything. Yeah. Like and learn curated about curated permaculture experience. Curated permaculture, yeah. So then, so you know, you can check all this stuff. If you go back to Permaculture Guy, there's another web uh, page that we've developed. Um, and so at the top, there's Earth Care Library. This is one of um, yeah, that's a good one. That's one of my favorites. Uh, and this is just basically a library. You know, this is one good thing about digital uh, media and website development. These are all books that are online and uh, Nathan did a great job designing this he would take the the binding of the book and uh, you know or you know create one from the uh, cover and so basically here is uh, a library that you know anybody with a phone and a data connection you know you don't have to worry about being without permaculture books basically you got all the classics here you got Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. You got Critical Path by Buckminster Fuller. You know, Eva Balfour, The Living Soil, um, Sand County Almanac, The Owner Built Home. Yeah. These are all, you know, classics, limits to growth. And if you scroll down a little bit, there's, uh, you know, a couple more. Mm-hmm. Girls of, uh, you know, great. There goes the Yeoman's Books. The last three at the bottom, Buffalo Bird, Woman's Garden. Um, yeah, I mean, cool. small is beautiful. Yeah, and then a, a new agriculture or permanent point of view by uh, 
Dr. Venkat, you know, you people don't even know what they're looking at when they see this website. <laughs> and most of the people who see this website never will understand you know, how much love, how much work, how much time, how much oh, talent. I can tell for sure. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I think uh, most people, you really have to, you know, I would almost go as far as say you had to take one of my classes. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Because I was a book hoarder. I mean, I was a, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bibliophile. Mm-hmm. You know, I love books. Oh, I do too. Yeah, digital, paperback, you know, and permaculture books is just a whole nother level. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm an archivist. I like, you know, I feel like, you know, these books are too important to, you know, not be available and easily accessible. So, you know, that's what Earth Care Library is. We also got, you know, BillMollison.org. Um, we got Permaculture Hacker, which is uh, awesome. We got all those pamphlets down at the bottom. Um, you know, Permaculture Hacker is awesome. If you check out Permaculture Hacker, man, that's, you know, very anarchist. And uh, so these are just links, yeah. To um, you know, a lot of kind of like, you know, I would say digital nomad, hacker, permaculture, kind of like this is where like if we're going to use the technology, you know, open source. Uh, you know, there's mutual aid, anarchism, port, gift economy, free store, all these concepts that perhaps in like an urban environment you know, would be really, really useful tour, sure. you know, peer to peer Linux, um, resource based economy, you know, and then even software, uh, you know, programs that we could, uh, use. Um, yeah. So things that are kind of esoteric that the average person wouldn't be into, you kind of have to be like a geek, you know, like hacking kind of, uh, you know, networking, you know, computer, you know, Mm. person to really be interested, like a lot of the stuff, uh, you know, uh, mesh networking, um, you know, like there's the fallen fruit website. That's where people say, Oh, there's a mulberry tree. Right. And then Mm. all the hip go on when they go to a city and find out where all the mulberry trees are, you know, and, Go on a mulberry tree tour. So that's cool. And then uh, if you go back, I'll I'll show you another one. The Bill Mollison one is uh, awesome too. And these are this is this is what I've been doing. You know, yeah. basically developing websites uh, and paying my students to develop these websites um, to make this information accessible. So now you know this is a website where basically you can access all the bills, videos, and, you know, uh, you know, there's the quotes, um, that kind of, you know, start, uh, just playing. So it just makes it easier if you want to, like for me, I used to watch, I used to listen to bill every day Mm -hmm. and watch all these videos, you know? So now if I want to do that, you know, here's one, one place that I could go to. I don't have to type in, you know, Bill Mollison on YouTube. You know, here this website just it, it'll take me right to him. That's great. That's yeah. so cool. It's it's amazing all the work that that you and and your collaborator collaborators have done on these websites. They, I mean, they look yeah. amazing. They they function really well, and it's just wow. This is Nathan Shannon, one of my students, and basically, you know, I I got made some money off of a job. Uh, that I had done when I was in Oregon. And so I had some some capital to work with. Mm-hmm. He had just graduated from my PDC, him and uh, and Peter Geinert. And, um, you know, I actually didn't have access to the cash. Uh, I was having some issues with PayPal in my bank. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I can't 
you know, this money can't has to do something. It can't sit up in PayPal. Yeah. And so I just started sending him fifteen dollars, and I said, "Look, man, just develop hmm. these websites." And I said, "I said, you know, I wasn't available as a designer because I was living in a tent. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And it just didn't have an office space to work out of. So uh, I just said, "Dude, just do the website and do whatever you want. This is the basic idea. I would send him some links here and there, but like like permaculture Wikipedia." I basically just told him the concept and, uh, you know, he ran with it. Uh, that was something, you know, he, I mean, basically delegating, uh, mm-hmm. investing in, you know, the people that you've basically, you know, I mean, basically your students, yeah. uh, and not all of them. I mean, a lot of them are going to do much. And, you know, many of them may not do anything at all, but, you know, if you teach permaculture by the book and really, um, you know, basically the way I look at it is like this. Every one of my students who learns the material and who can apply it in some way, shape or form, I mean, basically you got, uh, you know, a solution to the problem of being in a community of just corporate businesses and a bunch of consumers, which is basically if you give them, if you invest money into them, they're going to turn around and invest it right back into the system. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you got a good student who understands the designer's manual and permaculture and the history and Nathan is, you know, the best, I mean, he's one of, Best students. So I could, I mean, I could throw money at them all day, every day for the rest of my life. And so it's really a a great situation because, you know, instead of putting the money in the bank, I can actually put it somewhere useful with someone who will, you know, turn it into something uh, that's valuable for all of us. And that's what Nathan, uh, you know, and Peter um, have done and are doing with these websites in the Permaculture Guy Network, which is basically making all this information that we've collected over the past 10 years uh, through social media uh, more accessible instead of less accessible. Because on Facebook, it just it just eventually disappears. It's hard to access and to retrieve. Yeah, so we sure. designers can do better. And I think, you know, that's what, you know, all of us are doing at the Permaculture Guide Network. I mean, this small team of people that we're working with, we're managing a lot of information and we're, we're making it um, more accessible so we can, you know, spend less time online and more time actually working together, making gardens. So, you know, yeah. Very cool. Well, I, I just want to thank you once again for, for being so generous with your time tonight, Matthew. This has been a lot of fun and, as always, uh, very educational as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you for, for coming on. Yeah, thank you, brother. You're thank you for everything you're doing, man. And, uh, th- yeah, thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's great. Keep up the great work and, you know, yeah, All I'll right. see you next next week right next week same same time uh seven o'clock uh p.m central standard time and we will uh take on part two of this this final chapter of the conquest of bread so yep. right, i'll see you then have a great one thanks bro oh you're quite welcome all right and that was matthew stevens of uh, many different endeavors as you saw there bring it back to his main one there it's basically his, his splash page for, for everything. Just go to that permaculturegaia.org and you can see all the amazing stuff that, that he's put together with his team for uh, spreading the, the, the theory of permaculture. Um, so thank you all for sticking with me tonight. Um, if you want to follow my work, you can just go to l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory you can find links to all my different stuff um if you like what you see on on twitch why don't you go ahead and give me a follow i, I really do appreciate that 
so you get notifications every time I go live and, and we can uh, uh, build up a, a community around these, these really important ideas. Uh, that's, that's definitely my, my central goal uh, is to bring all these, these ideas together, permaculture, new urbanism, and, and of course, anarchism, as, as well as other leftist theories. So next week again, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, will be the, the, next, the continuation, the, the final part of the final chapter of, of the Congo of Bread, finally, uh, which we've been going through for the last um, six, 16, 17 weeks, basically. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long journey, and uh, I thank you all who have, who have made it with me very much. Um, and then also, every Sunday night, if you're, if you're more into... Uh, just kind of casual, uh, sometimes political, oftentimes political uh, sorts of things. I do a stream every Sunday night at, you know, kind of, we'll say afternoon to evening. It, it varies. Um, so make sure you follow me so that you can uh, get those alerts. Um, and, then, and I just kind of talk about whatever. Last week I, I was doing permaculture. I did a permaculture 101 uh, session. Oh, actually, no, wait, last week. In fact, was with uh, Dan Platt to the the Three Left show when we talked about new urbanist memes. I uh, had a lot of fun doing that. We've I've done stuff like just uh, making fun of various right wingers like Caitlin Bennett and and Abby Shapiro and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and you know, it's just kind of it's 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 more of a relaxed time. You know, where where we can cover basically anything. So um, if that's something you're interested in, yeah, just kind of. Be on the lookout for for Sunday afternoon to evening in the Central Standard Time Zone. All right, I'm going to go ahead and say lectam to you, friends. Um, and again, I will I will eventually get to explaining what that acronym means. Uh, if you're curious about that, 